分钟来开场好了，對还是我自己开？哦<笑>、oh, ，然后。我叫戴周，然后其实我原本是个自工系学生，后来跑去瑞昱做 RTO designer， 然后这是有点算是我平常休闲的兴趣吧。对，然后过去两年我们在 c o s c u p 就是这个一层轨，我们讲了很多开源硬体的呃流程跟 project 嘛，像刚刚有一堆 Open GPU 的介绍，然后呃去年有讲过那个一些 XT Flow 这样。啊！但是如果你现在真的很想要自己直接投入这个领域，那什么是你的第一步？就是我们今天的主题，就是 Relator。然后这是我 Outline， 我会大家讲一下 Relator 这个好用的工具，还有它的局限性。然后就它其实就是一根钓竿，然后看你可以钓什么鱼。然后底下就讲两个鱼，当我们的范例这样。然后我们稍微 review 一下，呃 ，IC Design Flow。啊，这个是从一个叫阿妈也懂的 IC d e s i g n for 那边借过来的，你各位可以上去 YouTube 上去找他的讲解。啊，然后这个是过度简化流程，就是、啊、如果你直接照这五个步骤做，应该会浪费沙子这样。好，然后首先第一步是我应该开个镭射笔。好，第一步就是 spec 嘛，例如说我们要准备两 r e s p e c t spec 这个东西，然后接下来你就喂给工程师喝咖啡，他就帮你转成 RTO code 的，例如说。就是你的 micro architecture 啊，这个阶段我们通常会写 code 会有点类似 A 等于 A 加 B 这种，又称为 very good behavior model 的那种层级。然后这个阶段通常会验证你的方向有没有对嘛。然后最常用的方法就是 simulation 啊，当还有其他的招式，那我们这边就先不提。然后呃，你验证你功能都对之后，就要做合成。合成完之后就合出 gate level list， 就是。把那些 A 等于 A 加 B 没拼成多几杂，然后再做 Gate Simulation 确定你合的有没有呃正确或错误这样，然后最后就是进入 APR 的流程，我、哦、就 Place and Run， 然后我们俗称 APR， 对，然后做完之后就做 Post Simulation， 然后产生 GDS Two 给台积电生产这样。啊，但是如果我们现在要走一个全开源的流程，大概要怎么做呢？首先我们在 Simulation 部分就有两个选项，其实前面有讲者有稍微提过，就是。b r e a t e r 跟 i b e r o g 然后后面后段的话就是去年有人讲过，就是 Open Lane， 就是可以一步到底全部走完，这样。然后我们再细看一下 Pre Simulation 这个阶段，就是一般来说我们常用的商用 tool 就是那三大家公司出的嘛，那三大家 IDA Company 出的 tool， 然后这些都是闭源的，而且要钱的。那如果你要用一些闭源，但是可能稍微免费的话，例如说。赛灵思的 B 8斗，现在叫 B T S， 它有提供 Web Pack License， 就是可以去呃免费的让你去模拟，但是我不确定它局限性到底到底在哪里。这样，然后像其他像 Intel q u a r t e r s 那边也有之类的工具。啊 ，Open Source 的话就是我们刚刚提到 i b e r o g 跟 b e r e t t e 然后简介一下 b e r e t t e 它目前是目前号称最快的 b e r o g 跟 C s m b e r o g 的 Simulator。但你讲它叫 simulator 很不正确，它应该叫 compiler。它实际上就是把 v e l o g 跟 C 加 v e l o g compile 成呃 C 跟 C 加加或是 C 乘 C， 然后接下来再跟你自己写的 test bench 用 C 加写 test bench 一起编编成你的 simulator。然后它目前 license 是 Open GPL L GPL V 三，就是比较宽松版本，就是呃你喂进去给它吃的东西还是属于你的。然后，另外它有一个 license 叫做 p e r l Artistic License， 就是它卷出来的东西也是你的。但是 Beret 有一个呃要注意的地方，就是它不只是个 compiler， 它也是一个 l a c e library 的东西，就是它有一些 header。啊，那 header 如果你把它包进你的 project 里，那就会受到 LGPL 的约束。这样。然后它目前已经有二十五年的历史，主要做的只是 Wilson Snyder， 还有呃几十位很活跃的开发者跟上百位的。呃 ，contributor 这样，那目前被 Linux Foundation 底下去 alliance 去类似让这个社群更加繁荣，所以自从加入之后，它的 commit 数量我这边没有图，你可以去它的呃社群看它的 commit 数量大幅成长。然后再就是因为 r e s p y 现在很红嘛，很多开源的 project 都用 b e r e t t e 基本上你所有看到路上看到 r e s p y Open Source project 都有提供 b e r e t t e 这个 solution。然后它在业界也很常被使用，像这是 b e r e t t e 官网上写的，让 Intel、AMD 跟特斯拉之类的大公司都有用
，阿特斯拉的话，其实他在三年前的 Hardships 大会上有讲过，他们使用这个 v e r i t o r 去开发他们 FSD 晶片的经验。各位有兴趣可以去找找看。然后学界也很多人在用，像 ETH 力，就是苏黎世理工大学或是东京大学，国内其实据我所知也不少学校有在用。然后甚至有一些。因为他现在业界有在用嘛，所以有些公司也提供他的 commercial support， 就三四家这样。然后他的特色的话，主要就是他 simulation 资源就是 Bell 跟 c s m b e l l 然后 c s m b e l l 不是全部资源，主要局限在可合成的语法部分。啊，详细的话就看 document， 因为他有些语法就不资源，所以还是要 check 一下。然后他不只可以模拟，他模拟还可以产生波形给你 bug。然后在它就是资源 syntax check， 就是 linting 嘛，还有 coding style 的检查，例如说 unused block d e t e c t i o n 之类的。然后也支援 c s m b e l g 的 DPI 跟比较旧的 b e l g 的 BPI 这样。啊，建议用 DPI 啊。然后再就是 c o r e coverage 部分，它支援 line coverage、assertion coverage 跟 toggle coverage， 但是不支援呃 arc transition 跟 state。然后它支援哦 ，sorry， 它支援简单的 c s m b e l g assertion。就是不是完整资源，因为 CMBL 有时候选蛮多很花俏的语法，主要资源就是 stable 或落实这种比较基本的语法这样。然后通常会有一个建议啊，就是你不管是用 Berate 还是用商用 Tool 都一样，就是你 SBA 写的越简单越好，你的 performance 才会高。因为 SBA 如果写的太 expressive、太花俏的话，会拖慢整体的模拟效能。然后它像 Boot Support 我查到就是 Throughout 跟 u n t i l 当然还有一些其他的。然后最后它有一个，呃，很关键的特点就是它是 cycle based simulation。啊，什么 cycle based simulation 呢？像我们一般呃 ，B C S 或什么其他 tool 的 simulation， 它看的 evaluation， 它还是看它的，你 Bell 格上面不会写什么 time scale， 你的时间颗粒度是多少，就是以那个为基准。但是 v e r i t o r 的话，主要就是以 cycle。啊 ，cycle 的时间颗粒度通常比你上面的 time scale 好大一点，所以这情况下它的速度就会比较快。然后。可是因为这个呃特性，所以它就不支援那个 delay， 你就 s h o p delay 就会直接被无视这样。然后通常的话都吃只有吃一个 clock source， 当然有些呃招式可以让它吃很多 clock source 之类的。呃，后面会提到有个网站有教怎么做这个。然后所以在这个情况下，你把它拿来跑 post simulation 完全没有意义，因为它就不吃 delay， 它也不吃 SDAF format， 所以你喂它吃这种 timing。i n f o r m a t i o n 其实完全没有意义，但是这个特点造就的就是它超级快啊，有多快呢？就是按照特斯拉那个演讲的说法，比商用 Tool 快了五十倍。好，然后接下来我们来看一下它的简单的 flow， 就是啊，你现在有一个 counter 点 B 嘛，就没有一个 code， 然后接下来你用 b r e a t e r 把它 compile 成 C 加加，还有一些相依的档案这样。接下来你就写一个呃 C 加里面方选，就是你的类似 test driver 的东西去 include 它，然后再把它编译一次，变成你的 executable simulator。啊，像这个就是它卷出来的结果，就大概这样。你可以发现有一大堆点 CPP 的呃东西，然后像这个黑的就是你可以拿来 include 的部分。然后它如呃你另外就是你必须要写一个一个 main function 去。去呃，类似初始化你的 Vector 的 context 嘛，然后像上面这边就是那个 Vector Header， 就刚刚前面提到他自己有包几个他专属 Header 这样，然后后面这段就是环境的建立，例如说你的微缝的 VCD 的那些 file 的呃建立这样，然后像讯号存取的话，就跟你一般写西加在在存取 class 的 member 的方法一样，就是直接叫什么？呃 ，R O s i g 之类的，然后所以啊，经过这个流程，然后就会跑编译完之后就跑出你的呃可执行的模拟器啊，这两页我们就跳过，因为这两个也很细。然后还有一个特点就是，它是一个 two state 的 simulator， 什么意思呢？一般我们没有个你宣告一个 register， 它有四个 state 嘛，就是零、一、unknown 跟 high impedance。但是 v e r i t o r 只支援零跟一，那你会问 unknown 跟 high impedance 跑是哪里呢？它就会被 mapping 成零或一，啊，这边零或一是，呃，你可以在模拟期间决定的。例如说
你可以在它你编译好后的 simulator 强迫它太零。像我这边是一个三十二 B 的 counter， 所以我太零嘛，所以就全部都是零。然后或者是这边是一个三十二 B counter， 全部太一，所以就是一堆 F， 或者是随便给值。那、啊、你可以问问，啊，我把 unknown 跟海影片子丢掉，那不就行为就错吗？呃，对，会错，但是因为会错。还代表就是你的 code 应该是有问题的，因为 unknown 跟 high impedance 理论上应该不该被拿来做运算嘛。就是我们会有个术语叫 unknown propagation， 就是你 unknown 的值一直往后去下去做运算，啊，你后面结果就是错的。然后这是它，呃，你看波形的话就可以用一个 to 叫 open source 的 GTK w a v e 然后它吃 VCD 跟 FST， 这是两两个 variator 都支援的，呃 ，format 这样。然后这是呃 Core Cabbage 的呃算小 demo 吧，它用的是 Linux Test Project 底下的 LCOB， 就是它会把那个 v a r i t o r 你执行完后的那个 Cabbage 的 database 去呃解析成一个 HTML file 去给你呃看你的 Line Cabbage 那些东西这样。然后我觉得这页应该是这个讲这个。讲题面最关键的部分，就是你现在可以忘记，但是这边记得要记得。对，就是我们会有一个建议，就是 b e r e t t a 好处就是它很快嘛，所以你可以用 b e r e t t a 快速的去提高你的 turn 的 long time。就是，例如说你们要跑一个小时的 code， 那你可能跑一分钟就可以打到你要的那个 bug， 那这样你就可以很快速的 iteration 去提升你的开发效率。但是 b e r e t t a 也是有缺点，像它有时候会编出怪怪的行为，或者是。呃，它有时候会跑爆，对，然后所以这个时候你就需要商用的 tool 去 cover 剩下的部分，所以我们通常会说，就是你用 Bayer 去 cover 百分之九十八的 c 那个 bug， 用很快速的方式，但是你用商用的 tool 去 cover 剩下十趴，那这样的话，就是可以大幅提升你的生产力，然后节省你的时间，然后又可以确保你的正确性。然后我们稍微呃复习一下我们在学校常学到的 r t o verification 的呃环境，大概就长这样嘛。就是左边蓝色框框是 p a t e n t 就是用来产生 test case， 然后喂给右边的 DUT， 就是 design on the test 啊。例如说你的 respect call， 然后 test phase 就是用来连接的部分。啊，当你现在你的 DUT 变成 CPU 的话，你就会遇到什么问题呢？例如说你的 memory port 会变成 AXI 或者 t i l e link， 或者是你会支援好多组。呃 m e r r y port， 然后再就是你要支援 i n t e r v a l 或 debug port， 然后再就是你的 p a t e n t 你的 p a t e n t 以 CPU 的话就会变成你的呃呃编译完的 code 嘛，啊，那、啊、你要怎么把它拿来喂给你的第三行的 test 呢？然后我们再来看第一个很简单很简单的 case， 然后这个 code 是叫 a k i l a 它是交大开发的，目前是就是一个经典的 five stage 的。Core 这样，然后它目前可以合成，并在 R T 3 5 T 上去跑，然后支援 T C N 跟 D K G I K 去这几个呃记忆体，然后它目前是交大的计算微处理机系统原理原则与实作课程的教材，然后不是微算机系，那是另一堂课，然后。呃，课程内容主要就是让学生去改那个这个 code code 的 code， 然后跑上 free autos 去研究一下 OS 跟呃 CPU 之间的关系，这样。然后这边我就不细讲，可以去交大课程网页上去找找看，这样。然后这是它的比巴豆的 bra d i a g o n 然后右边这三个子的部分都是三零四 IP， 就是 NIG 这些东西都三零四的黑盒子这样。然后左上角就是我们的 code 啊，我们要。模拟我们的 code 嘛，可是我很懒惰，就是算 IP 就黑盒子，我就拿验它也没什么用，所以我就就忽视它这样。然后我们的 interface ASI， 不过在内层里面还有一个更简单的呃 memory access port， 所以我们就直接拿这个来验就好了，就是偷懒这样。然后所以就就有右边这三个 code， 就是 i c a c h 的 i p o d 然后 d c a c h 的 d p o d 跟 i o p o d 这样。然后我们的 simple test 就会变成这样，就是我们会白色框框内全部都是 Bayer 哥，用 Bayer 哥写的。然后我们旁边造了两个假的 run， 就是用来存我们的程式嘛。然后它是一个突破假 run， 就是让我们的 code 可以去 exit 它这样。然后再来就是有一个假的 uart， 就是它行为跟 uart 一样，但是它不会对外 output， 它就只是呃 call 那个。
v e r g e r 的那个 display 去让我们再 console into Hello World 这样。然后最后最外外框黑色的部分就是我们的 C 加加 main function， 就是它用来呃去产生 v e r t e r 要的 clock 跟 r e c e s s i o n 哦。然后还有就是把城市码把 elf 转成那个记忆体的那些东西塞到我们的加润里面这样。然后这边就介绍一个 v e r i t a r 的 language extension， 叫做 v e r i t a r public meta command。然后它用途就是把你的 register for w i r e 或者是 function 或者 test 变成一个呃界面，在你的 C 加黑的中，黑黑的中。然后其实这个东西真有有够方便，还有我一直用这个，就是它长出来的东西就会类似这样。就是我们刚刚上面看到有一个叫 write word 跟 reward 的 function 嘛。啊，它就会被 mapping 到这边，就是你可以在 C 加加透过那个 m e s s a g e access 方式去 call 这些 function， 然后做你要的事情。然后我这边的用途是用来就是把资料写到那个假润里面。然后这是 a k i a 的 Velg hierarchy， 就是你可以看到就是 a k i a Tetanus 底下这些都是 Velg Velg call， 啊，上面这个 top 就是我们 v e r i t a r a s s i g n 的一个 top 这样。啊，这个 top 就是在这边被 assign 的。然后刚刚讲那个 hierarchy 的用途，就是你可以看到我们要 a c s 我们刚刚的 function a c s 的 hierarchy 跟我们的 v e r g e hierarchy 是一模一样的，就是 top a r c h i a t e s a n u s 然后 mark run， 然后 write byte， 就是完全一样，它不会帮你做些什么奇怪的操作，就是很直观。然后再就是这边，我们去加面方选这边还有。稍微改了一下 Respy I Star Simulator 的 L file load， 就是让我们把 executable 的 L file 去 pass 成那个就是呃记忆体要怎么摆放，然后的资料这样。啊，这是执行结果，就是你可以发现我们可以就是很简单的直接去 call 去吃我们的 L file， 然后就印出我们要的 Hello World 这些东西。啊，用 C 加加当 test bench 有什么好处吗？第一个好处当然就是 C 加语法。比 C 三六个强大太多嘛？你有一大堆 STD library 可以用，什么 stack Q， 然后 property Q 之类的。然后再就是它很好 link 其他 library， 例如说刚刚前面叫 L file load 的，或者是 N 克 sys， 就是可以在 console 上印些有的没的，或者是你就绑一个 instruction simulator 在里面，就你跑一步，然后就去比较一下你的 call 执行有没有正确，然后你绑一些分析的 tool。还有另一个就是 r e s t r i c t from end server， 就是我们下一个主角。然后就是我们另一个 case。然后这个 code 叫做 r e s t r i c t Soto， 它是 UC Berkeley Architecture Research 这个 group 开发的。然后他们也是，这也是一个教材，就是 UC Berkeley CS 一五二，应该是他们的 computer computer architecture 的教材。好像听说要用三个学期吧。然后它是用曲轴三写的，啊，曲轴三。呃，在后期会被转成 Velg， 然后喂给 Velg 吃，就可以走我们后面的一般的流程这样。然后它支援一个 stage、两个 stage 到五个 stage， 就是因为这是一堂，这是一个教材，所以就是要让学生去学那个 Computer Architecture， 所以就这些很多的 Config 这样。啊，部分的 Config 可以在 FPG、FPGA 上跑。然后它目前不是一个 Stand Alone 的 Project， 就是它需要有一个另一个 Project 叫做 c h i p y a r d 它就有点类似一个 SOC template， 你可以把你的 code 塞到这个 Chipya 里面，然后就变成完整的一个 SOC 这样。然后只是因为 Chipya 稍微麻烦一点，我们如果你想要学呃 r e s p e c t Soto 的这个流程快一点的话，你可以选择有一个 branch 叫 Soto O 的这个 branch， 它是一个 Stand Alone 版的版本，就是比较好学，环境也比较好架这样。然后再介绍一下 r e s p e c t Front End Server， 它是 r e s p e c t 早期的一个 tool 之一，就是一个原本是一个 stand alone 的 project， 后来被搬到 r e s e a r c s s i n 就是 Spike 的那个 repo 里面。然后它提供的功能就是，最主要就是 host target interface， 就是让你的，例如说现在这个 desktop 跟我的 simulator context 沟通，或者是 sim host 跟你的 DUT 沟通这样。啊，提供就是简单的功能，例如说 L file load， 然后城市的。呃，启动或停止，或者是载入，然后或者是有一个叫 predefined communication register， 就是 to host 跟 from host 啊，这个其实是一个后门啊，就是如果你要跑 display test， 你需要把你的结果写到 to host 里面，让这个 from end server 知道说你的结果是成功还是失败。然后这是 r e s p e c t Soto 的 u m a t o r 的 b r o a d diagram， 
然后因为 respire 收了他之前 respire 的 debug space， 所以你可以放在他这边绿色有一个框框是 debug module， 然后透过那个 respire space 定的 DNI 接到那个 debug transport module， 也就是 sin DTN 这边，然后这边外面会有一个用 c t m b l DPI 写的 sin DTN 点 cc 的一个 function。然后这个方向就会去跟这个 DTN 对接，然后把 f o r m a t Server 给的资讯喂给 Core， 然后就可以达到我们刚刚 f o r m a t Server 的功能这样。然后用 c t m b l DPI 好处就是因为它是 IEEE 标准嘛，所以就是其他 Tool 也是支援的，但是就是你的 C 加加那边可能还是要稍微改一下这样。然后这个 Flow 是呃。它上面 license 上面写 sci-fi 啊，但是我不确定最原始的 flow 的那个 project 是哪一个，我猜是 rocket trip。e r 就如果有人知道原始，就最原始是哪个的话，可以告诉我。呃，啊，这是 r e s p e c t debug space， 你可以发现它就是把这块 DTN 的部分取代掉，变成新 DTN， 然后变成 DPI 去跟外面对接。啊，有些 flow 是把外面这个 debug transport hardware， 就是例如说你的 j t a g 的 p r o b e 也取代掉，然后这样的话，你就可以透过 remote B band 的方式去跟 Open O C D 还有 G D B 对接，啊，这样你就可以用 G D B 去 debug 一个 code， 就很方便。啊，用这个 flow 的人最有名就是 Rocky c h e a p e r 然后这刚刚的 simulation flow， 啊，前半段就是因为 H T F 有提供那个 argument pass 的功能，所以。呃，前半段就是透过那个 reset function server 这边去载入你的程式，然后之后这边会有个 loop， 就是 v e r i t a c l a r k t i c k 的 loop， 它用来的功能就是检查你 code 有没有跑飞，再就是监控刚刚前面提到那个 to host 的 special r e g i s t e r 去检查你的 r e s p e c t e s t 有没有跑对。然后很蛮多 project 用这个 flow 的，就最有名的应该就 Rocky Trip 嘛，就是 r e s p e c t Demo 级的 project。然后它支援的就是两个，就是刚刚讲提到 DTN 的方法跟 j t a g 的方法，然后再就是 r e s p i r e b o n r e s p i r e b o n 就是 r e s p i r e b o n 就是 r e s p i r e 一个蛮有名的 o f f o r d e r 的实作，然后它目前不是 s t a n d a l o n e p r o j e c t 它一样也是需要 Triple 这个 Framework， 啊 Triple Framework 就直接把刚刚说的这个 Flow 包好了，然后再就是 ETH 力，就是苏黎世理工大学贡献给 Open Highway Group 的 c b a 6啊，另一个名字叫 Arian， 然后他也用这个 flow， 然后另外他有一个特点就是他还跟一个叫卓美九的 Respy RB 六是 GC 的 emulator 做 code simulation 这样，然后呃我主要讲的部分就大概到这边，然后其实有些进阶的 topic 可以各位可以自己去去 study， 就 v e r i t a 其实很像可以跟 UBN 跑，但我不确定他可以跑怎情况到怎么样。因为我不是做 DB 的，呃，然后 Vita 还可以吃 Multi c l a r k Source， 就是像这个网站 EIP CPU， 各位有兴趣可以去看，它很多，它是一家公司，应该是啊，然后的部落格，然后它有很多 Vita 很精确的讲解跟介绍，还有一些呃神奇的招式，对，然后上面这个网站就是 Vita 的官网，然后它其实不止 Vita 这个 project， 还有像。Very Log Mode Pro， 反正就是一个好像是 e m a k e 的插件吧之类的。我记得有四个 project， 嗯，好，然后我的报告就到这里。好。有。我怎么讲那么快？呃，收音的关系，现在比较少。那个麦是是会会会录起来。哎，你好，那我我原来在那也是做 DV， <笑>所以我在问，现场问你，刚刚最后提到那个 v e l a t o r with B U B 那个，现在目前是有已经有人在做了吗？还是说，呃，目前刚呃还没有人做这些东西这样，然后可能到什么，如果有的话到什么程度这样子？好奇，请问一下。到什么程度？<笑>但是我知道那个 project 经济啊，就是你在 v e l a t o r 那个 organization 的。的那个 GitHub project 下有 Vector UVN 的的那个 project， 然后很像国外有一家公司在 Vector 的官网上讲了蛮多，就他对这个 Tool UVN 的介绍还有实作，但是因为我真的不是那个专家，所以我不太懂他在讲什么。嗯、呃，好，嗯、呃，好，麻烦了。
呃，刚好就是我们有知道一些，就是关于 U V N 这边的，这样听得到吗？对，那它其实就是像刚才提到，就国外有家公司是 Ant Micro， 那他们在致力于做 U V N 这一块。那其实接下来的话，就是你们如果眼睛尖一点的话，其实呃 v a l e t 有新的 branch 叫 V 五，下一代的。那下一代的话，其实在在这个近期好像会推出。那他们其实就是往这个 U V N 去做做努力的，所以你们可以观察一下。对对对，补充一下。<笑>我们在我们有在做这个，就是呃 v a l e t 的 service。对，那其实有兴趣的话，可以跟我们做讨论。那其实我们也会跟菲呃 Wilson 开会啦。所以刚才主讲者有讲到一个，就是呃 v a l e t Public， 这里也会出蛮多问题。<笑>对，那这个的话，其实 Wilson 有跟我们。讨论过用什么方法做比较好，所以如果就是在座有有兴趣的，可以也可以跟我们做一些交流。对对对对，好，谢谢。好，还有什么问题吗？好。喂、欸，哎、欸，那这边请就是想问一些问题。那对，那这个就是第一个，就是因为 v a r i a t o r 这个东西刚刚很明显，它 test bench 是 C 加加写的，那就是我们常常会遇到就是 IC。那边来的工程师，然后他们其实对写 C 加加 test bench 有非常大的抗拒感。那、啊、我想你也在 Re, <笑> Real Tech 哎、欸、Real Tech 工作嘛，那应该如果要在公司推广也是会遇到类似的问题。那想看看你对这个有什么看法？那对，那第二个问题是就是呃，因为在呃 IC House 里面其实不会只验一个 CPU， 它里面每个小 component 理论上都应该会有验证。对，因为 end to end 来只验 end to end 太弱了。对，那那个 tar t a g o 也不够多。那想请问呢，如果想用 Verilator 做这件事，你有什么建议呢？就大概是这两个问题，就是 Sub M 九的测试、啊，那以及就是 IC 工程师对于用 C 加加写 test bench 的抗拒感。哦，对，谢谢。呃，关于抗拒感部分嘛，因为我是自工系出身的，所以我没有抗拒感。对，然后另一个问题的话，所以我就只能回答到这里。然后另一个问题的话，就是，就如果你要做 unit test， 那就把 unit test 的 bug 切出来做验证，其实也是 OK 的、啊。对，对，然后其实 unit test 好像蛮多其他的 project， 像有一个 project 叫 Coco TB， 一个用 Python trigger 的 unit test， 但是。我用拍惯，因为我不太会写拍神这样。嗯，这样。我还剩三分钟，如果快问题一分钟内可以解决的话，很，还有想问的吗？好，要不然就这里感谢戴总。那就戴总说，大家如果有需要的话，也可以就随时可以找他联络我。好，我应该会在这间或是 b r a t o 的那个摊位这样。没戴，明天过来。在行吗？开玩笑，没有开玩笑，开玩笑，我就说没带明天来而已。<笑>没有开玩笑，开玩笑。<笑>看是用什么方式可以以后再说，对。我问你哦，现在 retry CPU 啊，怎么去验证？如果他没有一些 speculation 的一些 bug， 就是像是什么 meltdown 啊，那那那些那些 speculation 之类的 bug。应该可以试着做，对对对，就是你一定可以写出，你现在都可以写出，写出写出打出 bug， 现在就是 bug。写出就是。哦，是是是是，我有有有，我因为这这是真的搬到我两边这样两头烧，我真的没办法，因为我。以不以后以后会那个尽量多，你们如果愿意来，那或者是愿意 sponsor， 我我我是我的 sponsor 是指说就来给 talk， 他真的是很欢迎，对对对，只、就是因为这次真的是在是，我对对对，你点头烧啊，对对对，要在公司，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对对对，对
更好，最最快的跑，对，最快的跑。那他一直要怎么讲？怎么看？我觉得他一直是健身的，健身。有，我我觉得。
么大家都演戏，是，然后就只爱吃东西，然后其他不吃。一个一个做，就一个做，对，是。好，就十分这样，就是如果有需要厕所啊，或者就是休息的话，十二点开走开，十二点十分开始。哎，真的，然后就是跟着上，还没搞定啥就还好吧？还是去楼下，因为我现在就开始到一点，算开始。我去，我去，我去，我到，我到，我想不到，想不到，确实那么可怕。不是我，你还提早一分钟。我上个月确诊，我我有时候只要待在家里，就继续求诊。啊，讲课讲到，讲到那个，就我刚刚做完这一周，就才认出来。没有，我从来没认出来过。只看那个，只看那个镜头。啊啊啊！就看你是不是做鬼？你怎么严重？我以为后面那天只要待在家。哈哈哈哈哈！我都我都已经没事了，因为那验证那个统一就整不出来了，就还是这么严重。他咳嗽的时候就按越来越快。哎，怎样子？有帽子，帽子，我只有看过你。我是，是讲到这么严重？对啊，他现在在干嘛？你要拍子还是昨天的？都是昨天，是几天？他什么？那个换牌子，哦，有换牌子，对啊，对啊，就两个人换牌子，把脸换掉。我现在在那个，九、嗯、月的时候去华盛顿大学，我好像也是做做发挥的，就是我们那个 team 有做，我们做整理出来，然后叫我们来陪人。哦，我知道，我知道，我知道。对，那个是我们 team。哎、欸、，OK， 哎、欸，他是他们是不是要那个被 CBA 吸进去了？就那个，我记得 Open Hub 好像有打算要去做这种长久的 adoption。我先看他们，就是你们看。那个 group 好像就是有奇奇怪怪的人做各种各式各样的事情，然后就炫耀。像也有听过说，就是有要做这方面的事情，对、嗯、吧？因为我们一定要做一个,做一,個,一,個一个小 group， 对吧？然后其他其他 group 在干嘛？因为我们都远距离，没有人沟通。我现在快去美国之后，希望可以多几个。第二届我死了，对，对对对，没几个人。去去年巅峰时期才三十个人在线上，超惨。看到这个就想到，我们原本以为就是，然后那些英文讲师在讲说应该会大白场嘛，然后就进来，怎么进不了了？从来都没有。对，台台湾弄一届太少，弄一届完了。团体走错路。对啊，团体走错路，因为。前前一天在金星，今天在赛跑，走错路。我也是，我也我也把你走错路。哈哈哈哈哈。阿弟有的，还好玩的起来。对，因为我我在讲这两个，特别。可是你工作不是私家的。嗯。然后外国刚开的私家的，台湾其实这边有重新的，所以工作不是私家的。然后还有金贵公司。R I D O S， 其实在台湾。蔡成不是以前在做，哦，你在蔡成杰。所以那个你刚刚提到说 N C Q 有 N C Q 是蔡成杰。就蔡成杰是啊，是。哎 ，Falcon 说，我有我有时候会讲 Falcon 的东西。因为我觉得他都太。我我还我还跟我老板讲说，哎，我们台湾有人喝那个奥罗佛的 V Five Co， 哎，要不要来听一下？有人结婚你没有讲？太凶狠了！整整的分公司，明年，明年，明年，明年，明年。哎，你们，我我真的有一直在找你老板，你老板真的不知道为什么，就反正就后来就不太回我信了，不知道太忙还是怎样。没关系。对啊，然后找蔡主任过来讲啊，我们台湾也是好歹有在做 Linux 跟那个，就跑出来出去搞搞去说他们，那个那个还还是不错啊，不要这样。凶狠呀！凶狠，凶狠，凶狠。确定一下时间，对，还有两还有两分钟要走 ，OK。我说好，我们要离开，我是家人东西，对，我不知道他谁到，然后就说哦，我嘴臭，然后现在所以已经要下一场了。哎，还是因为我在这边，就我妈。好啊，那你帮我。好。哦。
Hi. I will present you an exercise which is uh, recently developed out of the Superscala uh, software. So, a little bit of background first is that I'm mostly active on Spinal HDL, which is a hardware description library for Scala. The XS5, which is, um, you know, the soft core. And next XS5, which is the subject of this talk. And my background is both software and hardware. So I will mix really a bit uh, both wall during this presentation. So next XS5, it is a 32-bit and 64-bit XS5 core with a few extensions like multiply, atomic, single precision floating point, double precision floating point, compressed instruction set, supervisor and user mode, which is more than enough to run Linux, uh, like for instance, uh, distribution like build root and so on. And it is also enough to run, just enough to run Debian. So I'm currently working on that. Hopefully it will work uh, in less than one month. So, and one of the main attributes of this core is that it is not implemented in the XLNR system very well. And instead, it uses uh, software. Um, software like it uses a general purpose programming language, like let's say it's like C or Python or Java. In the case of Nexus 5, it is Scala. So it uses Scala to elaborate the hardware and to build abstractions layer. And so you can find all the source code there uh, if you want to. And here is a, for instance, an example of the car running Doom in Linux in a reverse engineered oscilloscope at a quite decent frame rate of about 75 uh, frames per second, which is quite good for the platform it is on. So I didn't need that part, somebody else did it. You can find some information here. And so I will mean, not go too deep in the architecture, uh, but I will give a few insights to, to get some feeling how this kind of core could work. So, uh, let's start by saying, okay, in the core there is two decoder, which means the core, when it fetch instructions, it can read up to two instructions per cycle to push them further in the pipeline. Uh, three issue, which is how many instructions can start execution each cycle. Uh, and to do those three issues, there is three pipelines. One uh, shared execution unit here, which does things like address uh, generation unit for the load and store, multiply, divide, control status register to manage things like exception, uh, interrupt, uh, virtual memory, and this kind of things and a few other specific instructions. And so this is a, a viable latency pipeline. And there is also two fixed latency pipelines which, which have a better latency, a faster wake up of depending uh, instructions. And those two pipelines are equivalent and they can do things like uh, add, sub, shift, jump and range instructions. So in the core, there is a concept of a uh, physical register in opposition to architectural register. So by, by architectural, architectural register, I mean that, for instance, when you write some assembly code, you will make reference to some register like uh, add x1 and x2 and put that in the register x3. So those are architectural register. And here in the core, I have more registers than this. So we have what we name physical register which mostly allow the execution to go uh, much further, to, to not having to wait um, in many cases that the previous instructions are done. Kind of allow to decouple uh, the instruction stream in a few cases. There is um, a reorder buffer, which is mostly something used to store uh, the context of the instructions in the pipeline. And so with 64 entry, you could have up to 64 instructions in flight in the pipeline. There is some branch prediction. I will, I will comment that uh, in the next slide. Um, 
why it's important to have a, a good branch product line because uh, this product functionality is quite high, it's about 10 cycles. If you compare that to uh, another car, it's about double the penalty, plus the fact that you, you lose all the things you already did in advance because you are in out of other cars or you may track a lot of, a lot of useful work. Uh, there is a notion of having a non-blocking data cache, which means that if you access some memory which is not in the cache, okay, it will, it will uh, go to read that memory and fill the cache uh, with it, but it will not block the whole system. It will allow, allow the system to do a few, um, other access to the memory, meanwhile. And so, yeah, I will just talk a bit about the branch prediction because it is a kind of an interesting topic. Not, not saying that it is any, anything groundbreaking in Nexus 5. I would say it's pretty standard. Um, but it is an interest, interesting thing still. So the branch prediction is done in multiple layers. The first layer is done in the fetch stage. So it's very early in the pipeline. And so the thing here is that <coughs> we don't have a lot of information to predict where the CPU should go next. We don't know the instruction we're executing yet because we are currently accessing the instruction cache in parallel. And <coughs> we don't know the data. For instance, if you have a branch if equals, we don't have access to the, we don't know the, the values that we have to compare to know if we have to branch or not. So, we have to make prediction for those two things. And so, in the case of NAX, uh, we predict which kind of instruction is in the world we fetch with the BTB. So, for instance, if you tell us, okay, um, because we still have a few information here, we know which uh, address we are fetching, and we know as well the history of the last branches, like we know the history of the last 10 branches, if they branched or not. And so with those two information, uh, we can print a few things, like, okay, maybe it is likely that the instruction at that given world is uh, branch if equals, and we also have to predict where this branch if equals uh, would branch if we take it. So, okay, first part of the prediction. And the second part of the prediction is done by the share, which is saying, okay, um, that branch in that world is very likely or not to branch, for instance. So it's a data prediction. So that's the first layer, which uh, we have a really fast response time. And then we have a second layer, which is then in the decode stage. And at that stage, we have a few more information. We, at that stage, we know exactly uh, the instruction that we are executing. We don't know the data yet, but we know, but we know the instruction, which allows us, uh, for instance, if the BTB here told us there is no branch in that world, here, in the decode stage, second layer, we can correct that eventually, if there is really a branch and told us before there is none. So we can correct a few things. Uh, we can also do some uh, better data prediction in the case of um, call, function call and function return. For instance, uh, return address stack is a stack structure in the hardware. When we do a call, we pop something on it. And when we do a return from function, we pop something out of it. So that's the kind of improvement we can do here, and using that to do some prediction. And, and then, finally, for instance, in our execution unit, the job here is not to execute the branch, but it's more like to check. Because at that moment, we have everything you need. We, know, we have the instruction, we have the data. So at that moment, the job is to control to check that the previous prediction did the job correctly and if not the case, correct them. And finally then, when we commit the branch, commit means like uh, we, we, are the, we can apply the side effect of the branch, at that moment uh, we can learn. So there is kind of a, a loop allowing the 
brands would tend to, to learn from their mistake, for instance. And so, coming back to, to a more general view, abstraction doesn't mean overhead. Um, in the case of TCPU, it got quite some decent performance. Uh, keep in mind, it is, it is mostly made to be a software. And so it tried to fit well in a FPGA. And for instance, in a Arctic 7, it, quite, it, it get quite close to uh, in order soft core frequency. Still quite more resource usage, but it's not too much for, for, for that big design. And so now let, let's dive a little bit into how, the, how you can generate the CPU, how the generation of the CPU is made. So, okay, you can go in the terminal, run this command line, then it will invoke the Nexus 5 elaboration, which is based on Scala as a general proposed programming language for the hardware elaboration. Spinal HDL, which is, as I said, a Scala hardware description li library. And so this allows us to generate some VHDL and Verilog that we can then, then run some simulation and synthesis with the uh, flow uh, you are used to. And on the top of Scala and Spinal HDL, quite a few abstractions that I will now focus on the next slide. And so uh, Scala, it is a good example of programming language, and here is an example how to write a hello world with it. So yeah, okay, nothing fancy. And okay, if you want to generate some very log file out of it, you could uh, use the file API of the language, uh, like okay, opening a new file, writing stuff in it, string by string. But that's really not what we want to do because this is this is horrible to do. And here is an example of the Spinal HDL API, where you can, for instance, import uh, the core, Spinal core, write a Scala main in which you invoke Spinal HDL to generate some variable of a given module. And then, okay, let's say define A and B as input unsigned 8 bits and result as an output uh, with the value A plus B. And this will generate this uh, very long net list. And so, okay, um, let's try to, to Let's look at this example, which is um, showing a bit the interaction between Scala and Spinal HDL. Because cool seems a bit weird to write this like that, why not directly writing uh, the Verilog uh, format? And so, yeah, here I, I will show a bit the synergy between Scala and, and uh, Spinal HDL. So, okay, let's define A, B, C as output side 8 bits. Okay, let's then define array as an array buffer of few So, array buffer is a Scala thing. It's a mutable collection in Scala. And so, you can store a reference to hardware signals of the netlist, like this, like, okay, you add A, B, C in our array. Then write, for instance, a for loop, which will iterate over all the elements of our array and we will assign each of them to zero. And, and how you can see uh, here, the generated netlist will be kind of uh, unruled. Um, because Spinal HDL will only see the, the part of its API. Basically, Spinal HDL is not a compiler. Spinal HDL is it's the concept of having an internal domain-specific language and it will register all the car, all the call to its API you do. For instance, uh, you will see, okay, uh, here he wants a new module, okay, he will add it into the netlist. You will see here, okay, he wants uh, output unsigned, he will add them, and he will not see this array buffer because it is a Scala thing. He will not see the for loop, it's also a pure Scala thing, but he will see the side effect of those things, like, okay, here, assigning element with zero and he will generate this. So that's really the concept. Uh, you could use things like uh, hash map, dictionaries, 
uh, all sorts of data structures that you want to elaborate the hardware. And so, coming back to Nexus 5, um, if you look at the design, there is a lot of pipeline, a bit everywhere. For instance, okay, there is one pipeline to fetch, one pipeline to decode, allocate, rename, and dispatch instructions, uh, one pipeline for each execution unit, and quite a few pipelines in the load and store unit, like one for the load, one to manage the address of the store, one to manage the data of the store. Once uh, those two things completed, there is another pipeline to, to apply some side effect and another pipeline to finally write back the data. I mean, yeah, there is a lot of pipeline, which is, which is maybe okay to write by hand if you, if you don't have to optimize a lot, if you, are, if you are really pretty sure of where you need to do what. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that I would say kind of never the case. Uh, you always need to optimize things to move uh, where in the pipeline you do some operations. And as of quite often here, those pipelines are composed with multiple uh, things in running in parallel. So you need to compose those pipelines with different things. And so what was done is a pipelining API uh, implemented on the top of Scala and Spinal XDL, where, for instance, here we define a module with A and B as input and signed, result as an output and signed. And then uh, we use our API to create a new pipeline and a few states like A, B, and C. So the states will be collected in the same order they are defined and with this connection type. Um, this M2 has been connecting things with a register. So there, is, there will be, there, there is also other connections like uh, instead of a register, use a queue, or maybe uh, directly connect wires from stage to stage, um, as you want. And then, okay, we come here, we okay, and we say in stage A, insert the value A plus B. And this will uh, provide us some but sum is not a signal, sum is a key allowing to retrieve this result along the whole pipeline. So we can go in stage C and ask um, the hardware value of representing the sum key and assign that to result. And then once we specified everything we need, we say, okay, pipeline, build yourself. And there you go. Um, the thing is how it works internally, because here we have this build function. So how this kind of function is defined is, okay, pipeline is a class, um, and in this class, we have a list of stage, so a elaboration time list, and we have a build function. And what will do, what, what will be done in this build function is like, for instance, we'll iterate over every stages, figure out what they need, uh, where the things they need is generated, and generate the hardware required to connect all those things together. And for instance, what is a stage? Okay, it is a class. And here, we have uh, a hash map, like a, a dictionary, which will allow the stage uh, to link a given key, like the sum key we had before, to its hardware representation in that stage. So yeah, we are using an hash map to elaborate the hardware we need. And so back a bit to Nexus 5 now, um, just a few, for instance, if you want to instantiate the CPU, you have a single parameter, which is a list of plugins. And this list of plugins, okay, it's a uh, Scala array buffers so or elaboration time list of plugin. And in this plugin list, we will add like a plugin to manage the program counter, one to, to, to fetch uh, instructions, one to decode, one to dispatch, commit, and quite a few others. And so those plugins, they are not uh, on off switches. So one concept in Axis 5 was to avoid having 
a big bloated top level where everything has to connect with everything it needs and as soon you need to add something you need to, you need to go in the spaghetti uh, mess to add a, a few modules a few connections and uh, it's really horrible so the concept in Nexus 5 is really instead to use this list of plugins if you look at the top level Nexus 5 here it's, it's mostly empty it's just a few lines and do not generate any hardware by itself but instead um, each of those plugin contain and define the hardware which need to be added to the Nexus and it also defines some negotiation with all the plugin to, to ask resources I will comment that later in the next slide. So, which makes things really flexible, like if you want to add an execution unit, like a ELU0, you come and you add an execution unit base, which is a skeleton of pipeline uh, execution unit, and, in, and then you can compose this skeleton with a few other plugins, which will uh, negotiate things with the execution unit base, to implement their behavior, like adding add some instructions, adding shift instructions, branch instructions, and so on. And like, if you want to add a second execution unit to to uh, to go faster with CPU, you can just come and add another set of plugins with uh, another key, like ELU one. And yeah, things will compose themselves. And so, okay, let let's try to look a bit what is a plugin. So. It is a class. Okay, in the, ca in the case of branch plugin, we will use the branch plugin for the next slide. Uh, we need to know on which execution unit uh, we need to, to work on. So our construction parameter. And this class extends the plugin base class. So we have the concept of inheritance here, applied to hardware elaboration, which allows us to define our early and a late uh, phase. So the early phase will be used to set up things like uh, we, we may ask to another plugin to provide us some interface um, and the little phase will be there to allow our plugin to generate some hardware. So for instance, in the case of the branch plugin, uh, we need to do two things. We need to detect if there is, if there is a mispredicted branch and correct it. And we also need to do an exception, a trap, in the CPU if the branch is misaligned. And so to do that, we need a schedule interface uh, to, to put the CPU back on track. And the way we can get this interface, so yeah, it, it's not to wire thing in the top level by hand, but it's more um, much more dynamic like than this. So we will uh, use some API uh, from the plugin base class, which is like uh, get the service which implement this software interface, commit service. So commit, interfa uh, commit service is an abstract class, so a software interface. And we can retrieve in the list of all the plugin, which one implements that software interface. Yeah, so like you have the base class service, the ba base class service, uh, each plugin is a service, uh, and there is a commit service, which is another service, and you have the commit plugin, which is a plugin, and implement the commit service interface. So we really have a class here key um, for our hardware elaboration. And once we obtain uh, a reference to this commit service, we can ask him via the new schedule port function to, to provide us a new hardware interface for our own usage to put the CPU back on track. Uh, and we ask the interface to be capable to uh, jump and crap. So yeah, that's the that's negotiation phase, for instance. And then the logic phase, and we generate uh, proper hardware to drive this interface with, uh, yeah, depending on the condition we detected. And yeah, we generate the netlist required to drive it. So instruction requirements. So, there, there was also the idea in the CPU that you could add its instructions easily in the pipeline without modifying uh, 10 files there and there and there. And so, for instance, in the case of the branch plugin, we need to specify that we will implement a branch uh, if equal instruction. And so the way we do that is we specify uh, what is a branch equal instruction. 
So caret is a single decoding, whatever that is, and with a given opcode. So here is the bit mask representing the instruction uh, branch equal, and a list of resources like saying, okay, branch if equals uh, is using the integer register file register source one and two. It need to read the program counter, and it need to read the byte of the current instruction byte. So yeah, here we, we define the instruction branch equal, and then what we can do is we can retrieve the execution unit base, which has the same execution unit IDs on us. So yeah, this is a bit the same pattern than before, but here we use a lambda function, like really a software thing to filter out, uh, because there may be multiple execution unit bases in the list of plugin. And there is a, a function that you can call to add, uh, to specify to execution unit that uh, a given instruction is implemented in its pipeline by somebody, us, in this case. And so this will have quite a few cascading effects. Like one side effect it will have is the existing unit uh, will figure out that somebody needs to read, uh, needs the value of the integer of the file as one as two and need, needs the program counter. And so the execution unit uh, base will then add the hardware required to read those informations if it was not already made uh, to make them available for the branch plugin. So, and, and a few other side effects is like the execution unit base will then notify the ECQ and the dispatcher that uh, it can execute a branch if equals. So, yeah, the branch if equals instruction needs to find its way through the pipeline through the multiple execution unit. That's how it is sorted out. Also, the decoder uh, will be notified that when it sees that bit pattern, um, it needs to read those two registers. So the dependency tracker um, will know about it, and eventually the register renaming system too. So there was also the concept of having composable pipeline, mm. and here is an instance. For instance, the branch plugin uh, will need to calculate where the branch uh, has to go, and so okay, to do that, he will retrieve the execution unit base with the same IDs as us, like in the previous slide. And then, it will ask to the clean unit to provide the stage from the pipeline API, uh, which represents the execute stage zero. Like you could you could implement your branch plugin over multiple stages, and here you you, you ask the pipeline API representation of a given stage. And then you can use, for instance, the program counter key to access the value of the program counter key, which was inserted by the existing unit base uh, above in the pipeline and drive the schedule interface. And so, um, yeah, another thing is there, there was a few, a few issues with memory inferring is that in and out of the core and super scalar core, you kind of often need uh, memories with multiple read and write ports. So uh, one way to, 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 to define the memory in SpinalHDL is that you can okay, define a RAM as being a memory filled with 256 words of a 16-bit event. Then you can create a few uh, write ports and a few read ports. But then um, the, the, yeah, the issue is that, I mean, it will work in simulation. It will work well in simulation, it will generate a uh, proper Verilog. But the issue is that, is that many synthesis tools to put the design on real hardware will not be capable to handle it. They may be capable to handle when you have multiple read ports, but multiple write ports, uh, it is tricky. So. The way how things are handled in Nexus 5 is the user can still implement memories like this in their pure way. And then um, there is some phase which will uh, walk all the statements defined so far. And it will retrieve. Because basically, yeah, in Spanish, there, when you define things like this, you will feed a netlist for conversation. Uh, internal representation of the netlist, 
that you can still uh, visit. Like when you do some compiler techniques things, you have the concept of uh, visitor, uh, the concept of abstract syntax tree, AST, and here we are iterating over this tree. Like saying, okay, in the current module, uh, walk all the declarations done. Uh, if, if you find one, uh, for, for each one of the memory type, then execute this block of, co of code. So here we have pattern matrix. Um, and yeah, you will get this in the terminal because it will, it will find this memory. And then what you can do is you can iterate over all the memory ports of given memory. Like uh, to count how many write ports there is, how many read ports there is. And if you know that it will make issues, then you can modify the netlist. Like, okay, say memory dot remove statement. That will remove the memory from the netlist and you can replace it with something else. Like you with maybe a black box or maybe you will want to emulate a memory of this with this layout using uh, multiple simple dual ported memories with some live value table or maybe using some XOR uh, technique on the data to generate multiple write ports. I mean there is there is many solutions. And so for si about simulations, um, in general when we have to simulate things, we have to go uh, to one of the big three uh, simulators. But in an open source uh, ecosystem, it's, it's not possible for many reasons. Uh, licenses are really expensive. Uh, there may be a few ways you can get something uh, working without a paid license, but it's really, really slow and limited. So. Instead, um, Nexus 5 uses Verilator. So here is the full flow, uh, okay, where you can generate the hardware as we've seen before. Nexus 5, generated from Spain HDL, we get some Verilog. And the concept of Verilator is it is a tool. You give Verilator your synthetizable uh, Verilog, and it will generate a C model, which is cycle accurate. It will only be able to translate synthesizable code, so it's it, it works well in our use case. So, from that C++ model, uh, C++ test bench that we have to implement, and Spike, I will come uh, back on Spike in the next slide. We will compile all those guys together uh, with GCC, and we will get an executable which will be our simulator, and. Uh, for instance, here, uh, our simulator, we can execute it with a few arguments, like to load a given benchmark, like it's the right stone benchmark, a given memory, and it will execute in terminal. At a decent speed, uh, it depends on the configuration of the CPU, but you will get between 100,000 uh, 100, hertz, yeah, 100 kilowatts, and 200 kilowatts of uh, cycles per real-time second. And so, to, to, to speak a bit about Spike, so Spike, it is, I would say, the official risk 5 simulation tool. So you can provide Spike uh, a given binary and ask it to execute uh, one instruction after each other. And basically, it will be used in our test bench as a golden model of what the next 55 should do. So, and basically, it is yeah, it is used in a way to check that our CPU is is staying in check with uh, risk five specification. So, in our benchmark, when our CPU next 5 commits something, uh, we will make spike commit something and compare the result. Uh, there is just a few, but it's still, it's not like letting Nux uh, run and logging something, letting Spike run and logging something, and comparing the two full execution log. It's, it's really a lockstep way, because, for instance, 
when you have an interrupt uh, proposed to NAX coming from outside, you have an interrupt coming from the outside, NAX will not necessarily take that interrupt <coughs> uh, in a deterministic, deterministic manner. It really depends on what it has to do. It may continue a little bit and then take the interrupt. And so for that reason, for instance, when NAX is five take an interrupt, that interrupt is then proposed to spike. So there is a few um, synchronization between the two models which are done like this to keep them uh, at the same execution, in the same execution flow. So as well, you can um, generate some traces, like um, in general, uh, people are using VCD trace in the open source world, but <coughs> with Virilator, more and more we can use FST trace, which are really compressed, and we'll keep track of all the signals of uh, the CPU. So you really have the full view of the design with it, and you can also extract some interesting metrics, like, for instance, how much uh, how much the ECQ is full. How much IQ is full, stock IQ is full, uh, to see when there is some uh, misprediction, when the CPU is rescheduling to a new to a new place, and you can also generate some Gam5 traces that you can visualize with Konota in a quite different manner. So this trace here is showing uh, the execution flow, which is the I executed when when they are fetched in blue, uh, when they are decoded and renamed, when they are waiting in the issue queue uh, for dependencies, um, and in line it is when they are being executed. And here you can see the out of order uh, execution in the core. Like for instance, <coughs> this instruction, even if it's uh, defined after this one is executed before because dependencies were already already available. So it's quite interesting to look in that uh, kind of graph to debug performances, to understand how the, the core work. And yeah, that's it. So um, here is a few links to the, with the doc, the GitHub repository. And the roadmap is yeah, getting Debian tested, um, memory currency and multicore support, and eventually why not trying to target ASIC? Because currently it's uh, mostly for soft core, but yeah, it could be interesting too. Also, yeah, thanks FinalNet for the funding, and now I should be here for the question. Hi. Charles, can you hear me? Charles, hello. Okay, we're having some issue here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I was unexpecting that, that I need to initiate a call. Anyways, so uh, for the audience, uh, this is Charles, who is the creator of the Next Respire and the Vest Respire, which is which is the very widely adopted software and win the actual RISFI software champion back in 2018. So we're here open for questions that anyone would like to know about his newly created uh, out of order RISFI core. Yeah, we have a live one here. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, but it's interesting uh, because from, uh, I, I know another uh, language like uh, Chiso and it's familiar uh, to your uh, uh, language Spanish or HDL. And uh, uh, could you please uh, uh, have a comparison uh, from your perspective uh, uh, for those two tools? Uh, having, um, having a comparison with what? Sorry? Uh, with uh, Chiso. Ah, with Chiso? Yeah, yeah. Um, mostly I would say 
Uh, there is a lot of history behind it, uh, especially when Chisel was in the version 2, to the second version of Chisel. Now it, it's Chisel 3, so things change a bit, but I would say that now mostly it is about strictness and linting. Um, Spinal XDL is a bit more like VXDL, uh, not letting you assign um, signal of different trees together. Um, there, there is this kind of things, I would say. As well, the, the rule where the names are handled is um, quite different. So overall, I would say a lot of little details. And one big details is that Spinal XDL integrate a library with all the, um, a, a large library, a much larger library than uh, Chisel uh, in the base language, like um, UART, um, SPY, a, a lot of peripherals uh, and buses are implemented in the core. That way, different people um, working with Spinal XDL will, will, can, can use the same uh, base. Thanks a lot. So basically, uh, Chiso is more like uh, just a powered solar language, and, and, and on, the, on the other hand, uh, the Spino HDL is equipped with many toolboxes and, and uh, a lot of simulation framework out there. So this is kind of a system very log uh, to the very log comparison. Do I uh, do I say it correctly, or <laughs> or do I misunderstand something? <laughs> I will not. I will not go to that extent because basically, um, Chisel and Spinal uh, share the same paradigm. Uh, just to be really clear, just really the, the interpretation and the details are really different. That that provide a really different experience. Uh, for instance, Spinal HDL keep the whole um, abstract syntax tree of the netlist. He keep the whole netlist in memory, while Chisel uh, flush it really fast into the FER. RTL format to go further with the flow. And he has, for instance, quite a few side effect, effects, like um, <coughs> Spinal XDL can track much more precisely issues because um, he, he can, for, for each potential signal, he, he can keep the whole stack trace of the context in which the given signal was created. So it, it's really a collection of implementation details which can make quite a big difference at the end. Thanks a lot for your, your explanation. Uh, I think also would like you to send up a lot of questions or? Oh, oh okay. Uh, I'm also very interested about your spin HDL and uh, the, do you have, can you explain uh, how did you do the uh, body lock uh, elaboration? Uh, the question about the log, what, what is it? Uh, Okay, uh, in Chisel, uh, we use the FIRTL uh, to elaborate the VLOG. Uh, in other words, uh, to generate the VLOG call. Uh, could you exp uh, is, uh, explain uh, how, how did you uh, do it? Uh, so, basically, Nicholas has... Ah, it goes... Yeah, 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 you go ahead, please. Yeah. Oh, um, so, yeah, the question is how it goes to VLOG, right? Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, it goes... Okay, when, okay, just to go the full path. So when you use the Spinal API, it will fill an at least in memories. There will be a few transformation phase, a few check phase, and then it will go directly to Verilog or to VHDL. It goes directly to it. There is no intermediate file format. It, it, it will, uh, so basically the Spinal HDL is directly being translated into the synthesizable Verilog without the uh, FIRTL-like intermediate. Okay. Right. It's, it's directly translated from mm -hmm. the high-level language to the, to the synthesizable Verilog. That's the paradigm using here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, guys, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any live questions here? Okay. Uh, if uh, still I have some questions, would like to ask. Uh, Charles, I'm wondering that uh, if I want to find you. Uh, in giving the funding to do another extension, uh, could you give me a rough amount of the the the, the budget? Because you know the Vexris file is very popular, and now you have the next file, and people are thinking that maybe they can donate money to you to implement some more complicated in extensions, such as the Pack Cindy or the even the Vector one. So I'm wondering, do you have any amount of uh, 
budget you you would like to receive to implement this kind of advanced extensions? So, uh, ve vector one will be something quite complicated. Uh, I, I, I would hope to not think about it too much because it, it's really um, a big one. Uh, but but pack SCMG, uh, it, it's really hard to know how to tell. Uh, I guess. Yeah, the, my main issue is time. Okay. <laughs> um, that, that's my main issue. Like, uh, I really have hard time finding time. So I'm trying to focus on on not too big extension. I see. So like, well, like a okay. few custom instructions for for a specific usage. Yeah, that's that's feasible. If it's really something too big, it really depends the moment and depending what I have on the hand. And then, if if the project is for open source. I would say I'm, I'm mostly flexible on, on the amount. I, as soon as it is reasonable, I will not charge uh, consulting fees for something open source normally. I see. Thanks a lot for your uh, impressive answering. <laughs> um, do we have any questions here? Uh, if not, then oh, so, yeah, yeah, we have a live one. Oh, hello, uh, I just curious about your low we are speculate larger strategy. Do you uh, fully support a uh, low store of order or just only low latent, like a low catch heat prediction? Sorry, which kind of out of order are you asking for? Uh, do you fully support of order of memory instruction or only just support? Uh, low catch heat latency prediction. Uh, I have, I have issue understanding, so I will just try to repeat to be sure I'm right. So you're asking about the memory system, right, for the load and store? Uh, load store instruction. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, you 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 are you are yeah yeah the, the the question is right. You're you're repeating you're repeating it right. Okay, okay. So, okay. So, the way the mm, the load and store uh, out of the ring works currently is that um, okay, load can be d done fully out of order. Okay. Um, store uh, will not block loads in any ways, and there is a store to load bypass, which is implemented. So the data cache is able to refill multiple lines at the same time. So the cache is non-blocking. So overall, the, 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 I would say the memory system is, is, is not bad in, in that regard. Th does that answer fully the question? OK, thanks. Yes, I think that uh, um, maybe there is also yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, maybe that uh, I will forward your. Could I could I uh, give him the email address from you that, or the the public one you published on the GitHub link? Maybe he will try to. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I will tell us send over the the content info for him to to for 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 it more deepen <laughs> asking. Yeah, and thank you a lot. Uh, we are having a session prior. I know it's very early for you, so good morning and goodbye. <laughs> Hi, 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 Matt. Uh, so we let me allow, allow me to introduce a little bit that the person here. Uh, this is Dr. Bomin Lee, who, who is the sorry, there's Hello. a kind of echo. Uh, so he's the lead. Uh, I, I would say the lead uh, of the Taiwanese uh, semiconductor education. So I'm inviting him to join us, and he will do some kind of live Q and A uh, after the, the the session. So yeah. 
and please go ahead uh, to to, uh, to share your screen, and we will. Without further ado, let's do your talk. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I joined a bit late. Uh, that's that's perfectly. Okay, please go ahead, and if you, if it's okay with you, please go ahead. Okay. Um, so thanks very much for inviting me to do this presentation. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, there's a, a rich history in semiconductors um, around the around the world, but especially in your area. And now, of course, there's the um, the huge impact of all the fabrication that's going on there. Um, and I've only been involved in ASICs for the last couple of years, so I'm very new to this. Um, and I'll just introduce a little bit about myself right now. Um, I work for Yosis HQ, who you may know do uh, open source synthesis tools, and those tools are used in all the open source ASIC flows. Um, and uh, we also do formal verification tools, also open source. Uh, I have a course called the Zero Basic Course that aims to teach you everything you need to know to get so, your own chips made. Sorry for and interruption. In a, so, so, sorry for interruption. Uh, uh, Dr. Paul, Dr. Lee, could you uh, mute a little bit? There's a lot of echo from your end. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Matt, please go ahead. That's okay. I was wondering what that noise was. <laughs> Um, and uh, Chipflow, uh, which is a startup that is aiming to make the most of this uh, new oncoming open source semiconductor tools to help um, get more product companies making their own chips. Uh, so if you're interested to find out about any, any more of those, you can uh, check the links in the presentation. And I'll be sharing a link to this presentation uh, later on. So if there's anything, uh, I've got lots of links in the presentation. And if you want to do further research, then you can uh, use the presentation as a, a jumping off point. So just before I continue, uh, Ruinland, is the audio and the video everything OK? Uh, we, we cannot see your slides. Did, did you just did disable it? Or, it will, if, or will, will you reshare it again? No, they should be shared. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So your slice is, is gone. <laughs> Can you reshare it or? Uh, sorry. <laughs> is that no? That's good. Is that is that working? Yeah, it's it's come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's here. It's here now. I will ping you to the. Okay. Uh, could you change lay change? Uh, also, uh, oh, okay. I will do it from my end. I will change the layout so it will be on the. Okay. Great. So, yeah. Come ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, if it stops sharing again, let me know because I aim to be sharing the screen for the whole presentation. I don't mean to turn it off. <laughs> okay. 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 Please go ahead. Good. Okay. Um, so let's take a quick review. So thanks for the amount of time that you've given me today. It's quite a lot of time. So um, I'm going to give a quick review of what has happened over the last two years in this space because things are changing very quickly. Um, and uh, I'm also going to give you a demo of the tools in action and show you the kinds of things that we're getting out of the tools. Um, so let's start off with the, uh, the quick review. So in 2020, uh, we had the uh, open source Sky130 PDK, which is, far as I know, is the world's first open source process design kit. And um, that's important for quite a few reasons. One makes it much easier for people to get involved without having to sign an NDA. So if you're doing educational work, that's a real key thing. Um, and the other thing that was announced was uh, having a free opportunity to make uh, your own chips. So I had actually just started playing around with some ASIC tools, a tool flow called Qflow. 
um, and I was, I was getting GBS, which is the file you need to send to the foundry. Um, but when I found out how much it was going to cost to make the chips, I thought this is probably not going to be something that I do much of. But when Google decided to pay for the uh, free shuttles, so there's a, a lottery system, uh, there's a shuttle that runs about once every quarter, and there's 40 slots on that shuttle. And if your design is open source, you can make an application. And I've applied to all six of the uh, shuttle opportunities, and my designs have been accepted on five out of those six. And I've had about um, 10 or 12 different chips made now. Um, my first uh, use of the open source, uh, open lane tools, I'll talk about a bit more about the tool flow uh, later, uh, made in July. I did a presentation in November, and we did a, I did my first tape out with a group of other people um, in December for MPW1. That was the first free shuttle opportunity. Um, in 2021, eFabulous, which is the company that help, provides engineering experience and helps us interface with the foundries and has done a lot of the work on uh, getting the open source PDK and the open source tools working together, uh, brought up one of their test chips. So that was good to see that things were looking like they were going as expected. And in May, they announced a commercial version of the uh, free shuttle. So that's $10,000 or 300 chips. Uh, then in June, we had the MPW2 uh, tape out date. In October, we got MPW1 silicon back, but due to some problems in the tool chain, which I'll mention a bit more later on, we thought that it was going to be a complete write off due to hold violations. So if you're into silicon, you'll know what that means and how scary that is, but if you don't, then I'll explain a bit more later. Um, November, December, we had MPW3 and 4 tape out. Uh, November, we also had Remoticon 2021. I finally got my own chips back from MPW1 in January, so it was a whole year for that uh, process. Ideally, things are going to go down to six months or so, but um, this first one took a long time because it was the first run through with the, the, PD, the first PDK and the new tools. MPW5 was March. MPW2 wafers came out in April, um, and MPW6 was in June, and we're expecting um, MPW7 in September, and there's more uh, foundries coming online and more PDKs coming online later this year. So that brings us up to the uh, present date. So I'm just going to give you a bit of information now about uh, my own first chip. So. Uh, this what this um, because when I first started with i I've done a bit of FPGA experience, um, but I wasn't really used to how much space we had available. So on these shuttles, it's 130 nanometers, which is uh, large. It's quite an old node, about 20 years old now. Uh, but 130 nanometers is still very very small, and we have 10 square millimeters in this uh, space here that we're allowed to use. And so I was finding that my designs were very small. So I did a collaboration with some other people, and we put uh, nine designs here, um, eight designs that have a kind of a function, and then uh, this big block at the bottom was a big multiplexer that can set each of the designs to be the one that is uh, controlling all the IOs. Uh, I've got lots more information about uh, MPW1 if you want to find out more on this link here. Yeah. And like I said before, I'll be sharing the link to this presentation at the end of this talk. So we had these eight projects here by me and some uh, friends uh, and mucks. On the chip at the bottom part, this part here, we have um, a RISC-V processor and two kilobytes of SRAM. Um, and we have a bit of firmware here that can decide which design should be enabled. So uh, the MUX did work, as we found out that MPW my chips worked. Um, but there was quite a few problems I had, uh, largely because I was doing everything by hand, because um, it was the first time through, and we didn't have much time. And I was very worried about making some mistake that was going to render the whole chip useless. 
So I was very happy when the chips got back and I got all my designs working. It wasn't that straightforward because I mentioned that we had these hold violations, um, uh, which I'll, I'll mention a little bit uh, later on in the presentation. If you want to get more information about my MPW on designs, you can check this link. So I thought what technical talk would be complete without a demo. So what better way to uh, show this stuff than doing a demonstration? So I've got the, um, the tools installed on my computer here. Um, and uh, just turn on the environment. I have tools for lots of the different uh, shuttles on here, so I'm activating uh, the tools for the, the seventh shuttle with this command. Um, and we have this PDK here, uh, which is two gigabytes installed, and uh, it's now very, very quick to set up the PDK and the open lane ASIC tools. It takes about two minutes. Um, I'll give you more information about how to set that up later. Uh, and then we have this open lane directory, and inside there we have a design directory, and then in here we have um, a list of all the, the designs that kind of come as examples. Um, and I'm going to be using this one called Seven Segment Seconds, which is an extremely um, simple design. So it just uh, divides a 16 megahertz clock down into seconds. Um, then it uses a bit of sequential logic to count, and then a decoder with some asynchronous logic to decode that into a, a seven second display. Um, if you're used to Verilog, just the hardware description language I use, uh, this is extremely uh, simple and straightforward, but for people who aren't familiar with Verilog, I'll just give a very quick run through. Uh, Verilog is a way of describing hardware, so it looks like C, but it's not really C, and that can be quite confusing when you start off. We have this uh, definition of the ins and outs of the module, um, telling it uh, that I want some registers which are kind of roughly comparable to variables, although these registers will be created as actual real hardware chains of flip-flops in the design rather than being uh, register spaces in a CPU, like if you're using a programming language. And then I have a, a sequential circuit here, which is triggered only on the clock, and it basically does the comparing, uh, counting up to 16 uh, million, and when it uh, rolls back over to zero, it adds one to a digit, so this is going to be creating two hardware adders uh, and some comparison circuitry and then take that number and put it out uh, through the seven segment decoder, which is asynchronous logic, which means that as soon as an input changes, the output so it's like a big collection of ands and ors and nots. And essentially, as this uh, decimal number comes in, it puts on the eight, the seven bit output, uh, the, the, the ones and zeros necess necessary to turn that number into a seven segment display. And I can uh, sh synthesize this and show you um, how Yosis will take that hardware description language and then turn it into a digital netlist. And this is essentially what gets sent into the open lane tools. So going back to open lane, this is one of the available tool flows that we have. It's currently probably the most popular one. It's the one that I know most about. We put our design in the beginning. Uh, we use Yosis to do the synthesis. Um, we do static timing analysis, which can measure how fast the circuit can run by looking at the, uh, the digital logic that is used to create that circuit. And we have a feedback loop here that we can do uh, some iterations on to get better timing if we need to. The current design for test is currently not implemented. Um, we come back through here. This, everything in this green section here is provided by um, Open Road, which is a set of applications that has been under development for 10 years or so, is funded by DARPA 
in the States and it's aiming to create a full open source ASIC flow. And they provide these floor planning and placement optimization and routing stages. Uh, then we do antenna diode insertions, um, which I won't talk much about, but is uh, important uh, in semiconductors to get a good yield. Um, within the semiconductor industry, there is a huge amount of depth. The supply chains are enormously long. The software is very complicated. The physics of how it all works is very complicated. So this, is, this whole talk and presentation is at a very high level, assuming not much um, knowledge. And so I could talk for, or experts could talk for hours and hours about any one of these points, and I'm just giving a very brief high-level overview of this whole flow. Uh, then we do detailed routing, come back through here. We extract the whole circuit, including the resistances and the capacitances, capacitances of all the wires. And then we do another static timing analysis to see if where the cells have ended up and all the routing, how these wires are connected together, whether that's going to change the timing and mean that the design is going to work or work too slowly. And then we stream out the uh, GDS2 files, which are the files, if you've done circuit board design before, they're a bit like the Gerber files that you use to send to the factory. The only difference here is we've got about 40 or 50 layers that we send instead of a normal kind of four rate or 10 layers that we send to a, a PCB fab. Um, you can get the tools downloaded from here. Uh, and I've also written a summary tool that I'm going to be using in this demo uh, here, which knows where all the locations of the intermediary files are. So let's run open lane now on these uh, tools, on this design. I'll come back up to open name. It's provided as a, as a docker with all the tools installed, so I just uh, mounted the docker there. And then I'm going to start running the tool. Seven, seven seconds. Let me just um, time it as well. This is a very, very small, short design, so it's pretty quick. It'll probably still take three or four minutes, though. Um, and as that's running, I'll start a new terminal. Just using my summary tool now. And we can uh, look at some basic stats as the design is working. So this is, a, this is the list of the standard cells that Yotis has decided we need. So to, to build seven second seconds, we need 430 standard cells broken up uh, like this, so we've got uh, AND, OR gates, uh, AND gates, buffers, inverters, muxes, three types of NANs, some NORs, ORs, um, plenty of different cells here. And there we go, this one is flip-flop, so we needed 52 flip-flops for that, because we're going to need at least 24 for the, uh, the seconds divider, and then another um, Mm, 12, 16 for the, um, the digit counter. Let's just take a quick look also at, um, in the PDK, oops, we get all these standard cells that we can use, and uh, I just loaded them all up. So all these different cells that I just mentioned, here we have on the left-hand side, we've got about 140 of them. So if we take that uh, DX uh, flip-flop, uh, you can see this is the standard cell. These are the layers that are in use to make it work. There's about 24 different transistors here all connected together, um, and it builds up a flip-flop. And if we now take a look at um, a much simpler um, standard cell, this is just an inverter. If the input goes in, high, the output comes in low, and this is built with complementary MOSFETs, CMOS, so we've got um, N-type MOSFETs at the bottom and P-type MOSFETs at the top, and they're joined together into push-pull arrangements. Uh, we've just finished this, so that whole flow took 1 minute and 44 seconds. Uh, let's, so let's continue with our, um, our route through, so we've just looked at synthesis. I'm going to go down now to floor planning. Um, the floor 
planning is looking at, okay, working out how much space we need, um, working out where the IOs are going to be, um, and giving us a kind of area. So let's see, let's measure the space. So this is 140 microns square. And then let's look at uh, the global routing. So now this is um, given us the power distribution network. So these uh, plus and minus lines run through the design. And then all these standard cells have now been placed roughly kind of close to where they need to be to fit to the pins and also what functionality they're going to be uh, fulfilling. And then, but one thing is that they're not snapped to the grid um, or aligned very well to the PBM yet. So that gets done in detailed routing. And now everything is on the grid. Things should all be, see all these big cells, those are the, the flip-flops, they're all kind of grouped together because they're forming these uh, registers. And we've got the IOs. And then the final stage is uh, generating the GDS. So now we have all the routing between all the cells, all the missing spaces being taken up by uh, filler, filler cells. And here we've got a list of all the different cells in use, and I can turn those on and off. So, for example, I can turn off all the decoupling capacitors that are used to fill up the space. Now we can see. What's this one? Down at the bottom, DCAP 12. It's funny, it's normally in alphabetical order, and I've already turned off the DCAP, so. Not sure where that one is. But you can see there's more space uh, now available. So the efficiency, the density of this design could be uh, even smaller, but we just wanted to get the tools done quickly. So this is now the full, the final design for that seven second seconds. We could now uh, integrate this into a design to EFLA, send it off and get our chips made. So, when you want to make a submission to eFabless, you do get this whole 10 square millimetres. This part here is always uh, present, which has a risk 5 core and some memory and some stuff to help you do the bring up, which can be uh, more complicated than you want sometimes. And then we can put our designs in here. Um, like I said, we had problems with this seven segment display countdown with all the, the, uh, the designs we put on MPW1 because we had hold problems. And those are caused uh, by not having enough time for the flip-flops to register data correctly. And unfortunately, you can't fix those problems by slowing down the clock. Um, but we were able to uh, get things working by very carefully undervolting the whole design and slowing things down. And that whole thing was caused by a misconfiguration in the tool so that the clock tree was synthesized in a not very balanced way. And that has been fixed for MPW2 and, and forward. So if you want to find out more about that, you can find out about that on this link. Uh, but uh, I was very happy that with a little bit of work on getting the voltage right, this tiny small design here, I did actually manage to get it working, although I had to kind of fake it because I could only get six out of the seven segments working at once. But that video was a, a demo of my design of that design that you just saw being synthesized with those open source tools, being put onto the eFabless shuttle, being made by Skywater Foundry in the US, being packaged, being sent to me, mounted on a test board, and then running uh, that design and actually getting the output. So that was really, really fantastic step for me. My first uh, very simple designs working on an ASIC. But now is a good uh, moment just to. Um, am I still showing my screen? Yep. Um, now is a good moment just to mention that uh, one of the ways that I'm now involved in this space is I run a course called the Zero to Asic course. So 200 people have taken the course and we've submitted designs on all the shuttles. It assumes no prior knowledge, so this is a really good way of uh, getting involved 
if you want, if, you, if this does seem interesting to you and something that you want to find out more about, uh, check out the course. I've also been working with eFabless to help with the, um, the messaging and creating documentation. And I recently did a half an hour video that did a complete run through from downloading and setting up the tools, putting a simple design on, to running all the tests, to generating the GDS, to sending it out to eFabless and getting uh, the chip submitted to the shuttle. So that is about a half an hour watch on YouTube and you can check that out, you don't have to pay anything. I'll just have a, a quick drink of water. So for MPW2 and onwards, um, I moved to a more automated design handling for putting people's designs together. So with the course, we typically take um, not always up to 16, but around 16 or so designs and we put them all together onto one submission so that we can uh, make the most of the pressure silicon. And each project has all the inputs always connected, but the outputs go through a tri-state buffer. So if they're not turned on, the outputs are floating and they don't affect the bus. But a bit of firmware can turn on the tri-state for a specific project. And you see that's what these highlighted lines are here. If I want to turn on this project, I turn on this line it activates the tri-state buffers and then the outputs of project zero control uh, the outputs of the actual chip um, and I've, I've successfully used that from mpw 2 3 4 5 and 6 although we're still waiting for silicon to come back it's now out of the factory mpw 2 is being tested right now so i should be able to validate that this all does work so fingers crossed for that uh, so now let's take a quick overview of uh, the tools in the space. That was something that Ruud Land said that he was especially interested in, so I wanted to include that in the presentation. Um, I built a list of a whole load of open source ASIC resources on a GitHub page, so you can click this link and get a big page of loads of resources. And these ones at the top are kind of the more digital focused uh, tools. So I have OpenLane, I demoed, Open Road um, is less of a complete flow, but you can still use it. It takes a bit more work to get running. Silicon Compiler is another end-to-end -end ASIC flow, as is Coriolis 2. Um, OSS CAD Suite contains all the FPGA and synthesis tools that you would need for doing FPGA development. Um, and we also have um, OS FPGA and VHDL support, uh, to just mention a few there. On the analog side, um, we've got Magic and K-Layout. K-Layout was a tool that I was just using to show the GDS, but you can also use it to draw. Uh, x -Scan is a way of doing schematic capture um, and also builds into synthesis, um, simulation. Mosaic is a more modern schematic capture. NG-Spice is a simulation tool for analog, and Zeiss is a, a, a kind of an upgraded NG-Spice, more modern, uh, being funded fairly heavily can do parallel simulation which is important because the analog simulation is incre incredibly slow compared to the digital stuff and GDS factory lets you uh, draw GDS shapes very accurately and is in use for photonics so what's missing that's an important question we do have everything we need to do um, digital and analog designs all the way through and we're getting results back uh, but we do have tools that are missing for RF designs, uh, which is important. We want to be able to do things like radios. Uh, we're lacking full wave solders, solvers. Um, we've got only a few different types of analysis. We don't have harmonic balance, transient noise, etc. Um, we they do exist, but we haven't kind of checked them. We have we need to actually do, start doing verification. Uh, we could do with improvements to the physical verification. We need this to be scalable for new PDKs. It takes a lot of work at the moment to add a new PDK to be able to be uh, used in this process. Uh, better mixed signal simulation. So if you're doing an analog and a digital design together, you want to be able to check that everything works together as you expected. And that's actually a lot harder than it should be right now. Um, design for test, I said that was one of the things that was missing in um, the open lane uh, tool flow designed to test here you would want to 
insert a scan chain or a way of being able to easily access the interior parts of your uh, project. Um, there is work in progress there, but it's still uh, under test. Simulating power, simulating clock and clock distribution, and also a, a library of proven analog IP would be great, like a big block of uh, analog to digital converters, uh, clock drivers, SERDES, gigabit ethernet, all this kind of stuff. We're waiting for this library to get built out and be tested and be useful so we can uh, use different bits and pieces and know that it's going to work together. So having said that, let's take a look at some of the example projects that have been taken out over the last two years on the open source uh, flow on the Google free shuttle. So MPW1, uh, there was a very interesting um, processor taped out that aims to run uh, MicroPython and had a bunch of USB peripherals. And one of them, uh, especially the USB peripheral, uh, is microcoded, so it's a very nice bit of IP. So the idea is you could take this USB block, drop it in, and then with a bit of microcode, set it to be an audio interface or a keyboard interface or a mouse interface or whatever you want. Um, this little nice screenshot here is a PLL for a 3 gigahertz radio. Uh, Thomas Parry building amateur satellite radio transceiver, and that's a very interesting project. Fuse Risk is uh, two RISC V processes with some custom FPGA fabric in between them, and the FPGA fabric is supported by uh, Yosis and NextPNR. Subservient is a tape out of Surf, which is a very, very tiny RISC V processor, the smallest one. Uh, analog neural networks. MPW3 saw some testing of some other tools, so Coriolis 2. Um, and FlexCell, rather than using open lane and the standard PDK, um, an 8-bit A to D, and uh, RISC-V Arduino. MPW4 saw uh, some space-hardened stuff, a fun um, transistor in the shape of a skull and crossbones, radiation-hardened chip. Uh, MPW5 saw a Delta Sigma audio DAC, uh, Microwatt, which is a, a new type of processor coming out of um, from Anton Blanchard from IBM. OpenFA SOC is uh, analog generators, programmatic analog generators. Uh, MPW6 saw a 10 bit uh, SAR ADD, uh, some reram tests, and some chaos generators. But these are just very, very brief. Uh, sample projects. If you want to have a browse through, then you can use the eFabless website, and I've also just rewritten a command line tool that lets you list all the tools and search them by their tape out status or uh, use grep or whatever you want to search for the, um, the descriptions of the projects. I just heard a ping on the uh, message, let me check what that was. A message from, from you? 20 minutes left, notification, thank you. So just a word on RISC-V. Um, I did a presentation for uh, RISC-V Japan recently, and one, I did a bit of data mining, and over the uh, six shuttles, there's been 270 RISC-V CPUs taken out. Um, I did a little bit of a breakdown here. We've got these other CPU types here, but RISC-V is the dominator, and then split up by type. Uh, these are all the different types. There's a lot of active development and testing going on with RISC-V in this space. And now I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the related uh, work in the field. So uh, SRAM characterization. Uh, we have an SRAM generator block that generates the IP that we use for the kilobyte SRAM if you need to use fast memory on your designs. But we didn't really know how well it worked, so Andrew Zinnenberg did some very interesting um, characterization with a test board and an FPGA. And as we get new versions, we can mount it on this test board, uh, plug it into the top of this board, and then run through this test again. If you want to find out more about that, you can check this. 
he really knows what he's doing in terms of high speed signal um, integrity and analysis. So it's a very interesting set of videos to check out. Uh, we had a, a fully open source ASIC focus conference last year that I organized with a lot of interesting talks uh, spread out over two days. Uh, there's the uh, there's WOSET workshop on open source EDA technology where people send us papers and uh, we review them and then there's a, a two-day schedule of presentations and you can check out the uh, papers and video presentations that were given in 2021 here and it's also being organized for 2022. Uh, there's been a lot of work now on putting the ASIC tools uh, running in the cloud, especially as either Jupyter Notebooks or GitHub Actions. So Proppy has been doing a lot of interesting work in enabling CMOS simulation and running the open lane tools and browsing the GPS files. And that is uh, really great for doing academic work and being able to share your results or educational work and avoiding big downloads. So if you imagine being able to um, let your students do simulation of these standard cells that I was talking about earlier, like ands and ors, but being able to do that all within the browser and without having to download uh, gigabytes of tools on your classroom computers, there's a huge amount of potential here for education, something that I'm especially excited in. And we've got uh, GitHub Actions. I've been working on a few GitHub Actions that can do things like installing the PDK, installing the tools, running the flow, running all the tests, and these are the kinds of things that I use um, for people on my course to make sure that the designs are all working. I recently had a very interesting interview with uh, a guy called Teo, who's been working on bringing up the open source uh, synthesis tools up to parity with the proprietary tools on matching the performance of their hardware adders. So previously, Yosis would always synthesize the same type of adder, which is kind of in the middle of this performance space. But if you wanted faster or smaller adders, for example, you couldn't choose those. So he did some very interesting work with allowing different types of structures of the, the carry chains of adders that allow you to uh, specify, I want an extremely fast adder because it's for the ALU of a RISC-V processor or I want a very slow but space efficient adder because I'm just doing like this seven segment seconds example that I showed you earlier and I just want my design to be really small. Uh, so more information on that here if you want to find out. And uh, we are testing his designs on MPW6. So now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about tiny tape out, which is something I've also been uh, discussing with Ruinland and uh, it seems like we're going through a bit of a Sputnik moment at the moment. Everyone wants to make sure that they uh, can have the skills uh, needed for uh, working in the semiconductor industry. We have these huge, very spread out, long supply chains. People are worried. We've got the EU and the US Chips Act, and more and more people are talking about education and getting more people into the pipeline to be able to be working on semiconductors in the future. Obviously not just a question of um, the material being available and the opportunities being available, but also that people think of it as a, as a valid career choice. And we see that uh, working in software is currently something that people are preferring due to better salaries. That's also something that needs to get fixed. Uh, but the educational side of things is important and Tiny Tape Out aims to uh, bring the barrier to entry lower for design and manufacture of ASICs uh, to high school students or makers or entry-level courses at university, open source silicon enthusiasts, uh, but ultimately creating the opportunity for all high st school tech students to design and receive their own chips. Uh, so it's a big goal, um, quite a difficult one to meet, but this is an idea of how what we could do to enable that. Uh, so I've already got a lot of experience with my own uh, course and something that's very important is that the course should be standalone. So you come into the course, you have an introduction on how the PDKs work, uh, you do simulation of standard cells in a web browser, there's no download of tools for this. Um, 
you do some problem solving uh, with digital logic, you build some combinational logic to start with, and then you move on to um, sequential logic and build these very small, simple circuits. And each segment of the course would be supported by templates and solutions, video introductions, and additional resources if you want to go further. Uh, you build your digital designs in the browser. So I've been working with Uri Shackard, who's um, built this uh, cool website called Wokwe, which is mainly for Arduino simulation, but he's uh, adapted it for us to use with digital logic. And we have this uh, very simple standard cell library here. And I can uh, give you an example of a, uh, a running simulation in the browser. I can just press the play button here. I've got a 10 kilohertz clock signal coming in, and then these 12 clock dividers to get a slower flashing LED at the back. And we're running this simulation at 100% at uh, real time. And what we now has an API which allows me to take this number, and use that to get a Verilog netlist, which will be uh, useful for the next um, section. So uh, let's move on. These are examples of the kinds of things that you can build in a very small area. So these are all for 70 by 70 microns. So these are some of the first kind of tutorial lessons, 8-bit counters, um, and uh, like this one is like the seven segment display. So you can see it easily fits in that 70 by 70. I tend to have missed a slide, here we go. So after we've got the, uh, the uh, the URL, that number from Wokwe, we can use a GitHub action uh, which builds the GDS in the cloud. So I can come here, edit this make file, change the number here, and then when the GitHub action runs, it um, will automatically install, download the tools, um, and generate me the GDS. So again, I don't need to uh, install anything or download anything. And then I can see uh, the, the result of my design here. So this is the, the layout. And I've also got all the, uh, the information here on the reports, this, the final summary report, the synthesis report. So we're going to give everyone 100 by 100. Everyone's going to get eight ins and outs. Um, you can run through this whole process. And then at that point, um, you'll have experienced the process and you'll have learned something about digital design and ASICs and semiconductors. But now there's a paywall. So now you can optionally pay for your design to be manufactured or your school can pay for you. Uh, we're aiming for $100 would get you your design on a chip, mounted on a PCB in your hand, and $25 would just get your design on a chip. So why would you bother with just getting a design on a chip? Well, that means it's, you can then, uh, as a school or a hackerspace, you can get an even cheaper price because you could get a workshop of 10 people, nine of them just put designs on, one of them gets the design and the, uh, the chip. Because all the designs are put on the chip, that means that the chip you get back can then be used to test all 10 designs. So that brings the cost of participation lower and you get your hands on the chip that has your design on it for very low price. So how do we put all these designs on? My current working demonstration, which I'll be taping out on MPW7, uh, features 500 designs at 100 by 100 and a little driver in the corner that can use the scan chain. So because it's a scan chain, things are uh, slower, but for beginner digital projects, that's no problem. We can still run them at 100 kilohertz. And we get 300 chips back, and those would then get mounted onto a PCB that we can then send out to people. Uh, so if you want to find out more information about how the scan chain works, you can uh, uh, check this. Uh, during this process while you're waiting, so that's one problem, six month wait is a long time for young people to wait. We're looking at ways of accelerating that. Um, but you would get emails about basics, ideas for designs, this week's coolest voted design, virtual factory tours, information when the wafers are out, information about when the PCBs are set up and sent. So that's, um, that's tiny tape out. And I've got another uh, few minutes, I hope. 
yeah uh around 10 minutes so 10 minutes uh, left yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I'll, i will ask around if there anyone here want to ask questions yeah get, if you can get a list of any questions and just in the last couple minutes i'm going to do a quick a very quick summary of what's happening next okay so no one's here no no one live here is going to ask questions but uh but, but uh, dr lee could you yeah could you bring some comments or questions here please yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. let, uh, let me let me just let me just finish let me just okay, finish okay. this off. I just need uh, two more minutes. Okay, okay. Um, so we've got multiple educational projects happening. Uh, we've got the IEEE Chipper Farm. We've got lots of funding happening in the space. We've seen the EU and the uh, US Chips Act. The EU Chips Act specifically mentions open source multiple times in their investment plan. Uh, we have a huge amount of community growth. Um, we've got the 90 nanometer uh, PDK <laughs> that's just been announced last week from Skywater, and we're expecting another, hundred, another 130 and 180 coming soon. And uh, now's the time to get involved. So uh, get download the tools, follow my video, take my course. Uh, next uh, tape out is MPW7 on uh, the 12th. As a thank you uh, to being invited for this presentation, I've made uh, five $200 discount codes for my course. You just need to use COSTCUP22 as the, um, the promotional code. Uh, lots of resources here, and feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Sign up to my newsletter, and if you want to check out in detail any more of what I've been talking about, then the slides are all on this link here. So that's it. That's my presentation. Thanks very much Thank you. for your interest and uh, your time. And yeah, if there's any questions, then I believe we've got uh, five minutes left. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Leeps, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mr. You, you, uh, your slide provided a very interesting and a very promising process of open source EDA tools. And uh, since the, the, the time is limited, so I would like to ask you, can you share with us your experience to avoid uh, the, uh, the failure you, you encountered in MPW1 so that uh, we might be able to bypass this, this fault process so we can learn how to create a right, right way to create an a, 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 a ethic from ourselves? Thank you. Yes, uh, good question. So the open lane tool is meant to be uh, an end-to-end -end flow that you put your design in and you just get the design out. That's like the aim, but things don't always work like that, as we saw for MPW1. But uh, really the best way that you can um, help with that is just to get involved and start making designs, because the more designs we have, the more tests we can do. And when the problems with MPW1 were found, they were fixed in the tool chain. So um, you can use the latest tools that don't have those bugs. Uh, that's the easiest fix. But you can also uh, read the source of the tools and you can make your own fixes and make your own pull requests uh, to the open source tools. And that's one of the great things about the open source tools is that there's a very uh, quick iteration time in getting uh, these bugs fix quickly. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So, so we're having actually around three minutes left. So, may, may, uh, I, will, I, will, I would like to ask something that um, Matthew. Uh, how is the tiny table adopted? Uh, how is the adoption rate? Uh, how many? You know, you must be lobbying around the high schools. How many high schools have been already adopted the Tiny Tape Out program? Uh, well, Tiny Tape Out is still in a very, um, in the idea phase. So at the moment, I'm explaining the idea to people and presenting it and uh, finding, trying to find collaborators. So I want to work less with schools and more with uh, people above the schools who can say these 10 schools would all be interested. Um, so, I'm also working with um, academics in university bodies, um, and there's, there does seem to be a lot of interest, um, but I'm still kind of waiting for the person that can say, um, 
I am working with making sure that, uh, that schools are teaching uh, relevant technology. Uh, this looks like a great thing and we want to run it across these uh, 30 schools as a trial. And then that will be the, the moment that I will um, kick the design off. Um, either that or for MPW7 for the test, I'll just make it free to participate and we'll see how many people we can get involved just to test it out. Okay, thank you a lot. So I will, uh, because we are having another speaker already here, so I will be mm -hmm. ending this part. But uh, uh, Dr. Lee, I know you must have a lot of questions we'd like to ask with the Matthew. So I will hand up from my side. Hand up from my side, but uh, you can continue to discuss with Matt if you want, if you like to. So here we go. Uh, uh, okay, I will go go to another session. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Danish, Danish, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, just give me one second to adjust my. Uh. Oops. It's kind of messy here because I just switched from <laughs> one side to another. Okay, here we go. Uh, you are you are up and online, and uh, let me. Uh, uh, without further ado, let's in, uh, introduce uh, Dinesh from in, uh, India, who is uh, working on the pin-to-pin -pin convertible RISC-V SLC, which is very, very interesting. And please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks, Rana. Let me share my... You are able to see my desktop? Yeah, yes, it's very clearly. Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. First of all, thanks for, uh, for the invitation. Share my experience on the open source shuttle and one of the projects what I am sharing. So, about myself, uh, I have around 20 plus year experience on the VLS design. I have worked a lot on the most of the aspect of RTL to GDS flow from uh, architecture to uh, depot and also I have a lot of experience on the post silicon debug and system framework. In my career I worked for more, most of the more, more most of the commercial depots around the 180 nanometer to all the way down to 10 nanometer. So I worked in a company uh, like uh, Cypress Semiconductor, Centilium and currently I am working in Intel as a design manager at Intel India. So this let me start my presentation. I thought just thought I'll just give a brief background on what is this open MPW shuttle project what we are discussing. So this is the sponsored by a shuttle which is sponsored by Google and it is managed by an EFS team and the tapers are done in the Skywater uh, foundry which is a 130 nanometer. And if you see the main uh, points are, there are 40 free shuttles are given per shuttles, free slots are available. And currently the way it is running, I see there are 4 shuttles are there per year. This is an approximation I am just saying. The main requirement is to keep the design complete in the open source. Uh, your design you need to keep it in the open source. And uh, the cost of the fabrication, packaging and the file evaluation board and shipping it to everything is covered by Google. And in this, uh, when you are looking for the chance, they are going to get a 50 parts, packaged parts, and five development board, they get it. So if you see the, how the actual uh, design is uh, going to sit within the open shuttle, the Caravan, the EFLS team has created uh, one harness where they created their own small PCV uh, core here. If the projects are without any risk core, you need an external way to configure it. You can use their risk key, small risk is there, which we can use to configure it. And for a user angle, they given a 10 mm square free space. So whatever design you, you we, we develop, it's going to fit within that and the, your final integrated chip will be looking uh, like this. So it is a 38 pin package and uh, the pins are already frozen, but uh, you have a control that they given a subway, you can manage these IOs. 
and you can control it. So this is how what the, the MPW shuttle project. So about the, my experience, guys. Uh, actually, I started on open source shuttle around December 2020 times. Uh, I think that time exactly the MPW one, which was also already announced on the 2020 December, which I was not uh, attempted in any any of the project on that one. So, but I started for the MPW two, which was uh, around the June 2021 timeline. The effort was planned. So since because because of my sort of experience, I don't want to do a small project. I thought of taking a basic RISC-V based SOC design. So I thought maybe that's what I should do as I must my first trial. So but when I started, it was like a, it was a tough ride for me. Which I thought it will be a smooth ride with my experience. I thought, but uh, when I started uh, running using the tools, I see a lot of issues. In the most mostly in the most of the issues you can see the system were lag, limited system were lag support was there in the simulator and I were lag and synthesis. So whatever SOC design I picked, nearly I need to modify nearly 20 to 30 percent of the design to match, uh, compile the simulation design in say able to simulate within the same simulator and synthesis. So that was it took my lot of my effort and I done a two and pro to find out is it my design correctly working and simulator working and some of the places tool was compiling but uh, synthesizing but it is uh, totally optimizing the design because of some specific system where lost in syntaxes. So I can say it, so it was a tough way I had to simulate it, cross check the simulator is not uh, totally optimizing the design and also uh, since only there were limited complex SOC was there only MPW1 was taped out I had very limited references to cross check to flow, flow wise. And also in the flow wise, I found it, uh, it was like a totally a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, instability was there in MPW2 time. I see each macro to synthesize it, I was, uh, it was, uh, two was breaking in one or the other place, you know, it may be synthesis or clock tree and power routing, global routing, one or the other places, uh, tool were breaking. I need to place a bug report on the corresponding tools and uh, those are iterations. So, so it, it was, I can say it's a, uh, so a lot of effort uh, gone in my first, first step in uh, experience way. And also one of the things what I saw was the, how the tool, the porting, uh, the mechanism they managed. Uh, so the, the concept what they done is, first the, there is an independent, uh, the um, open source community tools are managing independently, the YSS, Iverla, uh, Magic tools are independently managed by the independent open source community. Those are picked by open OOP team and they were merging it and creating a open lane tools. So one of the main issue was there was open lane team, open road team was picking a version which is somewhat older, like a three to four months, six months older than the main branch. And they are collecting it and creating an open lane. And that open lane once again if it is taking it and creating their own additional patch and releasing it to the open source, our open source shuttle project teams. So whenever there was a bug and when I report into the main source uh, common, uh, so tools, when they fix it, taking that to throw the flow itself was becoming a big problem because of the additional patches what uh, e this team used to add. So it was like, because of that, I was faced multiple issues to find out how the tools both uh, mechanism is there to break it so that I am able to complete my taping activity. So, Overall, so it, these all things took me more than six months to understand how the flows are implemented. But finally, after uh, around six to eight months, I got to clear the, my tape out uh, checklist. And one of the things I observed is during MPW is there was no clear timing closure mechanism. So they were more on the GDS clean database than the timing closure. That's what the stress was there. And even though I raised multiple times, the interest was, there was no less follow-up was happened around the time of question. So this is what was my first experience in uh, the MPW2. Next MPW3 was around 15th uh, November 2021 time. That time I, since I had some experience from the previous one, I tried a two tape ports that time. And this time what I see it is a somewhat better managed in the sense uh, the open road team himself was managing the 
total to uh, directly giving. So the additional patch is what each address used to do that got uh, removed. So effectively, whatever uh, the open community tools were directly can be easily ported. So that reduced a lot of efforts uh, on my side. So whenever I see a new bugs are fixed in the main tool, porting became somewhat easy. So, so with that and also because of the, my previous shut, uh, whatever the effort, it helped me to uh, clean up the tape out activities well within the timeline. And I can say it's a bit uh, smooth ride for me at least compared to MPW2. And uh, and MPW4 to MPW6, uh, I done around 8 a -ports. So, and I can, I can say it's, it's, it's a bit smooth trade because of the total understanding what I built up on the previous uh, tape ports helped me. So, around next uh, 3 MPW, I nearly taped out around 8 shutters. We will go through brief on some of these uh, tape ports, what I have done. This is just to flash what are the tape ports I done in the MPW shutters. So around uh, 8 na S recipe based tape ports are done and around 3 non recipe based tape ports are done. And if you see in MPW 2 time I try attempted only one. In MPW 2 3 times I attempted two uh, MPW shutters. In MPW 4 I tried two. And in MPW 3 5 I attempted three tape ports. And MPW 6 I attempted the three tape ports. We will go a little bit on each and main project to what is there and what is what I was driving there. So this this is the first project what, what I uh, draw in the MPW shuttle MPW 2 time. And uh, here we basically uh, what I took is uh, I took in uh, Santa Co uh, Risvi 32 bit core and uh, I tried to uh, I build an uh, H4 interconnect and I added a uh, uh, you call the SPI master to talk to the external flash because there was no in, inbuilt flash was there, uh, flash memories are not there in the uh, Skywater Foundry or Foundry, whatever libraries they share, we don't have any flash memories. And also I integrated an SDRAM controller for, for our data random, the data memory purpose, for the risk to have a data purpose. And also I added some peripherals like a UART, I2C master, and USB 1.1 host. And this is, was my first MPW 2 tape ports. And uh, in this, so this what, in the design wise, I made a lot of changes in the uh, system verlock logics around this to match to simulator to work within the open open shuttle tools. And one of the things I can highlight is that with this whole thing, I'm the tool set was I am able to only meet the timing with uh, 50 megahertz only. So I made it each blocks, these main blocks, these whole blocks runs in a different block domain against uh, this week core. This week core had its own block domain, but till uh, finally the uh, current the tool, MPW tool set was able to only meet the design only within 50 megahertz only. This was my first attempt uh, what I tried in the MPW two time. So this is one of the non recipe based tape out what I tried in the open shuttle which is like a, which I tried for MBS controller where in MPW 2 times there were some SRAMs are uh, developed by the other teams and I took both SRAMs and I built an MBS controller where it is going to test how, how reliably these memories are coming and I wanted to validate my MBS also which is required for my future development so I added the MPS controllers so here basically I put four uh, uh, eight uh, uh, memories I think some are two KBs some are one KBs I think some type is area so, so basically I tried an uh, MPS controller with eight MPS controller and eight memories and this aim is to just to see my MPS controller and also how this SRAMs works and here I one more interesting important things I taken care is I given a four location memory memory repair options I given in this MBS control. So that is a feature I wanted to validate in this MBS control. So next one is uh, just a upgrade version of the previous MBS controller where I tried a logic beast. 
So the current uh, open shuttle doesn't currently support the scan method. There, be, there is no way you can implement a scan and validate your design uh, implemented correctly. So I done some hacking in the flow and uh, I built an 8 channel scan in scanouts. I took the previous MB test uh, project and added a serial scan in and created on my own LBS controller where it created the uh, peer based pattern and uh, transfer a duration and checks that the final signature matches with the golden. This is just to check how the scan is going to run in that uh, system. Uh, so this is the project uh, which is one, one of the non risky project which I turned in the open sheet. So now let's come back to the rich you know, which is the one which I'm nearly driving, at least I tried, nearly I'm trying the eight tapers around this architecture. So this is this is an little bit RISV based SOC design, where I'm trying to target the pin, its, its pins are matching with the Arduino platforms. So, so if you see it, this was a somewhat upgraded version of my first RISV core. And I made some little bit changes in design. I added a cache, like instruction cache and data cache, and, uh, and uh, a tight memory added. And I split the core into uh, three, sp three splits. The main control of the risk core I separated out and uh, I built an interconnect so that if I want to add a multiple cores, I can connect it. And uh, so, so they kind of they connected the directly through the uh, they commonly supported an I cache and B cache for them. And, they, and there is a common architecture created for the wishbone interconnect where individual peripherals can be connected. So I connected uh, the quad SPA master and two UARTs, uh, I2C master and uh, USB 1.1 host and SSPA. And uh, the ADC, actually I am not yet integrated, I am looking for some community help to integrate this. Um, I am more expert in the digital side, unlike I need some help. So I am continuously monitoring with something in the open source set things I can fill, pull and add it here. So currently ADC is the one which is uh, missing in this design. And apart from that I added a pin max. The aim of the pin max is to match the pins uh, as it in, uh, in the audio. So, so, uh, so the things wise. So one more, one more thing I added is I given an uh, booting options. So there are three ways you can boot the whole chip. You can boot through the Caravel has its own uh, wishbone interface. You can go through that. You can boot the whole chip. You can configure it and wake up the risk core so that uh, uh, you can even throw this. You can configure the external flash. And uh, once you uh, program the program it, then you can wake up the risk core so the system brings up that things. So there is one more mode I given is a UART. So UART wise also there is a message handler I built it here. The external if you are connecting through the uh, UART, you can go and configure as it comes as a master, you can go and even configure the flash. I given a standard uh, write uh, and read commands through the serial uh, port. You can go and configure it. Even though Caravel uh, interface was not working, I can go through this and then I can boot the whole system. That was the uh, given a backup options here. And third option I given is the SPA slave. So this is uh, something similar to what you see in ISP in Arduino. I made a sim same pin compatible to ISP way where you can uh, through the SPA of the ISP you can go and configure uh, all the flashes and you can bring up the chip. So there are three booting options what I implemented in the uh, as it is not like in the first version I supported in MPW. I can say it's over individual MPW, I done some improvement. Like these are the final design what can publish here. And one more thing is, uh, one more thing is from MPW six onward, uh, I am able to meet a timing um, at, at at least at 100 megahertz. So previously, as I told in the first one, the maximum time I am able to close is only 50 megahertz. But with the tool improvements and some design changes in the pipeline, now currently the design is able to meet at 100 megahertz, which is, I can say, is a good improvement from the, the over the setup. 
and uh, one more thing uh, i can say is actually the design wise it is not like a one single clock domain design so i implemented uh, a multi clock domain domain the designs where the risk score has its own clock it has a core so that a timing of risk score is not deciding the rest of the clock domains so system clock has separate clock and this is built with separate clock so so uh, so increment on the risk score can not uh, the timing of the risk score not coming in